Today on the Poker Life Podcast, we are joined by a man who played two of the biggest pots ever played in televised poker history over the past uh, past week or so, and also took down a pretty big tournament for Short Deck Hold'em in Triton Poker Series for $3.5 million. And uh, we're also going to talk about the newly released Chris Ferguson video that came out yesterday that people in the poker world have been talking about. And um, that's, that's it, guys. Joining me on the podcast today is a young man who... Uh, is debatably one of the fittest men in poker, debatably one of the hardest working men in poker, debatably has some of the craziest stories in poker. And uh, he, listen, man, he's one of our favorite podcast guests, one of our favorite people in the poker world. He's a man who wouldn't release a video seven years after the fact if he did something crazy. You were joined by Jason Kuhn. What's up, Jason? Welcome to the podcast, man. Welcome back. Hey, brother. What's uh? So you've had a you've had a pretty you've had a pretty big week, man. You've had a pretty big last uh last couple two weeks. You're over in uh in Montenegro for the Triton Poker Series, and um you were you were mixing things up, man. You were mixing things up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh it's pretty wild that we um, televised that. You know, I was thinking like there's games like that that have ran that I've played before, um, but uh it's it's pretty neat to get that collection of guys and be sitting there and be playing those stakes i was like whoa this is something that just kind of happened organically on the fly and the next thing you know we're sitting here playing like televised 2k 4k it was actually bigger than that it was 20k 40k hong kong even though that wasn't uh displayed on the screen we all agreed to settle in hong kong dollars so it was like it was actually like 5200 us dollar big blind and like uh thirteen thousand dollar ante or whatever so it, that was a big big cash game for sure yeah that seemed like a uh it seemed like it started off with a nice mixture of players we had a couple of the asian guys we had a couple of the american players and then it sort of became more american players in there and uh the game looked like it, it got a little bit less good it was still that was a good game that was a fun game for sure i mean there were some uh I, that was the first time i played with elton and uh, he was in there blasting he was treating that like that was a low stakes game and i I, I wasn't sure to which degree he was messing around until later, whenever I saw the hands, and I was like, whoa, he was really in there doing it. Yeah, so how does it feel to be a part of what I believe are, we need to talk about that, how big, so you and Elton played a pot. Now, how yeah. big do you classify that pot that you play with Elton? Because I, it, to me, at the beginning, I was like, I think that's the biggest pot ever because of the bet you make on the river to bring it over 2 million euro, but yeah, then I start thinking more about it, I'm like, eh, Maybe it's 1.5. Man, I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. You know, I'm just sitting there trying to count the pot and think about stack sizes and the rest is kind of relative of that, uh, you know, from I think four hours of that session was televised and we played maybe 45 hours that week. Damn. Um, so there was, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of pots around that size and um, are bigger. And I don't really remember. I remember thinking, it, it had he covered me and I reloaded and maybe had like 1.2 or 1.1 million in front of me and I shoved the river for I believe third pot roughly so yeah, I think it was like five something into 1.5 yeah so that, I mean that's a yeah it's definitely a, a big pot I I guess that the the way it works is you have to be called on the river and and funny enough I think he had a hand that probably should have called me given the way it played out um but uh so if, yeah, if he would have clicked the call button, it definitely would have been the biggest pot anyone's seen. But I don't know. I, I don't. I don't really worry too much about the size of televised pots anymore. I'm just in there trying to trying to do the right thing, and those were definitely high pressure situations. And not only on the TV, uh, but that week about killed me playing. Whenever I wasn't in a tournament, I was playing cash games that were uh, oftentimes bigger than than the uh, the televised version, and in against really smart capable people and uh yeah that was that that's definitely a different different league over there for sure i i uh not to go on too long of a rant but it makes me think like people oftentimes are like oh where's where's Durr? where's phil ivy those guys have fallen off the face of the earth these guys are like they're not doing it like they used to anymore and it's like i'm sorry public but you don't know what's going on over there uh i promise you i know you guys all want to see it and you all believe that you know, if they're not playing a specific TV show or a specific tournament, they're they're probably busto. But that's just not the case. Those guys are playing in games that are bigger than you could ever imagine. I mean, there's games where money is being exchanged that you can't even wrap your head around it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, we definitely got a little taste of uh, of the action of the craziness that might go on in these games. And I think if to some people out there that watch poker, I think it makes sense 
where Tom and where Phil and where more guys have been because when you see how those games are, I mean, those games don't really exist in America. You don't, you don't see things like that. You don't see stakes like that. Well, there's not an economy for it. You know, I mean, these guys, these guys can lose actual hundreds of millions of dollars and be okay. And that's just not, that's not the case. I mean, we had one guy like that on the internet in Guy, and I think he lost maybe what 30 million or something. Or Yeah. I think it was about 20, 30, something like yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, 30 over the course of it all. And you're talking, um just in these private games that white people can't play in um it's just basically all chinese um but you're talking guys that there are several several fish that have, have lost over 100 million us in those games yeah it's pretty crazy i mean i guess we can imagine that maybe some professionals have made a i wouldn't say near that amount but i mean i don't really know who knows i guess no, we, it's hard I mean, to really know who's up what over there there's definitely guys that have won over 100 million US for sure elton that game that we were playing uh him he was donking around because that was like him at the local casino playing one dollar two dollar that game was way too small for him uh and that's a guy that was playing two dollar four dollar online uh next thing you know a year later he's playing 100k 200k hong kong no limit or something you know and and he certainly won over a billion hong kong for sure playing cash games um there there's guys out there and and uh None of us know, you know, people just really don't know. And I think that it's, it's easy to assume and easy to judge. And, uh, but I promise you the guys that are being quiet and are just kind of showing up and they're in the right places at the right times. I, I would be, uh, I would be hesitant to, to say too much about those guys because they're probably doing just fine. Yeah, I think a lot of people sort of see people go off the radar and then you might see them around poker once in a while. But I mean, a lot of those guys that I know that are used to be maybe more, I guess, visible in the poker world and now they're undercover. Those guys still play a ton. They just play in private games and they don't want to they talk. Play, about they play games. in bigger games than any any game that you can film. And that's why they're not playing televised games, because the games are too small for them. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. just the truth, you know. So is that going to happen to you at some point in time? Because you were out there mixing it up. You're playing these super high stakes. You're You're having these big swings. Do you feel like now, when if you look at some of these lower stakes games, that they're just a little bit too low for you to play? Um, I think it's all relative to what your net worth is. Sure, like as years go by, there's games that you know don't make sense to show up and play anymore. I mean, it's you know, but that's different for everyone. I mean, you know, the the adjustment for me would be every year. It's like I there's like this nostalgic value to me playing World Series of Poker, but you know, there you only get so much energy and so much time, and like, yeah, I'm gonna I, I might play a tournament here or there. But like it doesn't really make sense for me to show up and play a, a World Series event right now, you know. Um, and then to the extreme, like one of these like guys that have really done it, you know, it probably doesn't make sense for them to show up and play a 501k US game somewhere, you know. Um, it's just it's all relative, you know. Uh, and I think it's just the main thing that I've tried to do is consistently keep my ego in check and be good to people and keep my mouth shut and always look for what I think is the, the most EV for me and for my lifestyle and, and the decisions in my future. And, and I just try to add that up into the big complex equation that we're all always trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And whatever that equals, I, it's, I just try to make my best guess. And that might equal me sitting somewhere in Montenegro or me sitting at the Rio or Aria or whatever, you know. Where else, where else could you be sitting at? Could you sit on like a an unknown island. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where else, where, where else around the world they're gonna find you at. Yeah, yeah, it could be anywhere, and it also could be you know unpoker related. Maybe I just get you know I, like last summer, I think Sauce just got in a van and disappeared for a month into into Canada with his wife, just chilling. And I was just thinking, man, what a boss this guy is. Just like completely disconnects, uh, and he's just out chilling, you know. Yeah, I could see Sauce bringing the treadmill desk up there wherever he's going and uh, and just disappearing. We're maybe in the lab working hard. Who knows what Sauce could be doing for a month, man? That, you never that guy, is, he's, he really is uh, such a role model. You know, it's I think about him and he's, you know, nobody knows who the best poker player is, but he's certainly been one of them for a very long time. And he's younger than I am. And he's so mature and has his life together and is truly like living a life by what he thinks is the right meaning for him. Everything he does is, you know, if he doesn't want to travel, he's not going to travel. If he doesn't want to play, he's not going to play. And I think there's something to be learned from that because one, the longevity of his career and two, the prosperity. I mean, that guy is just such an animal. Yeah, I mean, he's had success at High Stakes No Limit, High Stakes Pot in Omaha, playing High Stakes Mixed Games. I, the guy pretty much has learned 
all these yeah. different games and had success with them all. And he's, he's still like, battling them all right now. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's very impressive for sure. I wonder if he's going to be coming down to the series. Are we going to see him at the series this year? You know, Ben's coming down. I, I, I think it just depends on what kind of mood he's in, man. He, whatever he decides he wants to do, he might just want to watch politics for the rest of the summer and just not play a hand of poker. I, you never know what that guy. Sounds slightly less fun than coming to the uh, coming down to World Series of Poker. I don't know. Coming down to World Series of Poker, it's kind of a magical time around here, man. We got people, everyone's kind of coming to town now. We got the 300K Super High Roller Bowl that you're going to be playing on Sunday. Uh, you know, kind of people coming in town for that. It's very sort of, I don't know, kind of special kind of energy around here for that first week or two. And then and then after that, everyone sort of, you know, evolves, in, or evolves into their own little world. Some of them get stuck. Some of them are up a bunch of money. Some of them went out a lot. So it's kind of... But that first week or two, I feel like it's a pretty special place out here. I think the entire thing is special. And, uh, yeah, the whole way through, I, I really I love it more and more every year. And it's just so great seeing everybody here. And, um, you know, everyone's story changes every year. It's just so neat to kind of catch up with people you haven't seen and kind of, you know, oh, now I'm working in a restaurant and not playing poker full time. Or, oh, I had a baby this year. You know, as the years go by, it's really cool. And I just have so much love for it all these people that have tried to make poker uh, their, their means of income for 10 years. I mean, if you've done it for this long, it's even if it's not something that you're totally into anymore, if you're still a part of this. It's just such a feat. You know, it's such a game that can just demoralize you and punish you. And anybody that's been coming back at it for, for this long, it's just like props to you for being here. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. I mean, it's just so hard to, even it's hard to stay motivated or stay consistent for that long and stay on top of your game and, and keep working and keep trying. So, I mean, anytime you see someone who's been playing for 10 plus years, however they've done it, whether they're some big game selector or a massive nit, and maybe if they're a short stacker, I don't know, but for the most part, you got to have a lot of respect for that. And uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It's uh, I think that that's something that as a community, we really should start to do. It's, it's easy to like, be like Twitter jockeys and sit and hammer each other all the time about stupid shit. But like, we're all kind of like in this, in this network of each other's lives at this point, you know, we're all like constantly uh, shaping one another. And this is like, this will be our story. When we're old, we're going to think about all these different interactions that we've had with each other. And I think uh, at the end of the day, it's just going to be tons of admiration, even for people that you've had a little beef with, you're going to have admiration for, you know, because they're mm -hmm. part of your story. Yeah, I think that's how I look back on a lot of people I played with online is that even though we like battled a lot or maybe we talked some shit at the table or maybe we told each other to go die after one of us maybe sucked out. You look back now and I think I have a lot of good relationships with those same people and talk with them and I see them in Vegas. You know, we're having a conversation for a while. And yeah, you uh, miss that. Yeah. Man, so much love, you know. <laughs> well, you get to see way. So you might uh, let's talk about this action that happened, the million dollar cash game. So. Sure. I guess there's two hands. Let's talk about the hand that we won first. So the hand that you won was very unusual hand because well, let's, talk, let's talk about the hand I lost first because it's in order. I lost the hand and then I won the hand. So let's 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 deal I'm, with. I the want to focus on the hand you won first, but okay, let's go with the hand you lost first. Yeah, so you and you and Kane played this pot. And you the kind of redemption. Okay, let's set the stage. You set the stage for this hand uh, okay. against you and Kane. So, um, all right, for me internally, I'd been playing for about 17 hours to this point. I was feeling pretty good somehow. I don't know. It just kind of felt like I was floating because we were playing a short deck earlier in the day prior to this for uh, big stakes, I think 40K anti short deck. So that's much, much bigger than 40K uh, big blind, uh, which is what we were playing in this game. And it was a 10K anti, which is two and a half big blinds, which is quite unique. You don't really play that format. Uh, in no limit very often that is a massive ante i mean in your average tournament you know there's about a big line to 1.2 big lines laying in the pot so um if people are adjusting correctly you're gonna have to play much much wider there's so much more money to win um and this hand i believe i was in the hijack and i was up small in the session maybe i had like 1.2 or 1.1 in front of me and uh yeah, it's the bigger ante, so I opened for 3.25 uh, big blinds um, into Paul's big blind. And Paul was drinking McAllen 25s, having a good time. Uh, he was pretty loose, as you all saw. And Kane sat down, and I'd never played with Kane before, but I, I knew that I needed to just respect him as a good high-stakes pro whenever I was kind of coming up. I remember watching him play 2550 on Stars. And on top of that, I know he's made plenty of money in poker and outside in crypto. I, 
Uh, I have no clue, but I heard that he got into Bitcoin at like $7 a coin or something. So I'd say he's doing all right. Um, and the game probably just feels like a normal stakes game to him. He's probably pieced out. He doesn't seem like a degenerate. Um, so whatever. I opened the hijack ace queen uh, offsuit and Makita Bujakowski, uh, Fish 2013, calls the button. Um, and then Kane three bets the small blind to 55K. So uh, not big size. I think that's 55. It's like a little under 14 big blinds. And Folds back to me. So a few things to take into consideration. One, Pulse and the big blind drunk. That's not that big of a deal, but maybe thinks I'm opening a little wider into Pulse. Big blind, I think that that's a reasonable assumption. Uh, if this was like a no ante game, I would just fold ace queen pre um, to the squeeze or ace queen off pre to the squeeze and continue more suited stuff. And uh, But with that size ante, I think folding is a little out of line. And I think that it's a mix between a call and a four bet. Pretty good blockers to four bet sometimes. Uh, the Also, the other thing noted was Kane got clipped. So I believe he was starting the hand with around 220 big blinds um, rather than the buy-in, which was for 250. Uh, so I actually misclicked my four bet and made it too small. I believe I four bet to 130 K Euro. What an absurd game, right? Four betting to 130 K Euro. Um, yeah. So I four bet small Makita folds and Kane calls. So his range to get to the flop is a bunch of the obvious kind of pocket pairs, like the eights through Queens maybe a tiny percent of Kings. Although I think most, especially at 220 big blinds with this ante, most of his Kings are going to find a way to be all in pre. Most of his ace King is going to find a way to be all in pre, but certainly can have some ace King. Uh, he also could just be like, whoa, this is a million euros. Like, I don't know, but he could be like, this is a million euros. Like, I don't want to just put it all in with ace King. That's very reasonable. You know, maybe the stakes do affect the way that he plays. But I think as a default, if he's just trying to play like an equilibrium strap, most of his ace king is going to just jam it in my face here. Um, and then he's going to have some suited aces, some suited broadways, some suited connectors, uh, you know, some suited kings. My four betting range, uh, if people are wondering, like, not to be too specific, but, you know, value for this stack is going to be ace king, maybe some amount of queens, but not all of it. And then just like kings plus. So kings plus, ace king suited little bit of ace king off like if you four bet ace king off here you're not folding to the jam um and then my bluffs are going to come from kind of the obvious stuff suited aces um suited kings a lot of suited kings are going to be in there for sure just concentrated suited suited equity uh blocking some of the hands that shove on me kings ace king um and then just like random amounts of suited connectors so he calls and the flop comes six five three rainbow i believe yeah six five three rainbow I don't think he can have a six suited in his range, but it's kind of reasonable that he has ace five or ace four. So he has a few combos of suited aces. Then he has, like I was saying, the pocket pairs. I doubt he has any traps. I mean, maybe he has a tiny amount of aces, but probably not. I don't think it's out of the question for him to have some aces, but I remove half of those combos. Um, he checks to me and I half pot the flop. I think that, um, the way that I was approaching the flop was I wanted to have a bet size that on specific turn cards you would find uh, yourself all in, and then on specific turn cards you would size down and have a smaller size. Um, that being said, it might just be better to just kind of third pot your range rather than use a half pot size since like my value range is so nutted. It's just like kings plus right at this point. So. If you have value, you you don't need that much protection, especially if he has a hand like jacks or whatever. He just has two outs. Um, so I have pot the flop. He calls. The turn's an offsuit 10, which was pretty interesting um, because now half of his pocket 10s combos are gone. Um, unless he has a set of 10s, mm -hmm. then uh, he's doing all right. But, um, you know, I block queens, which I think is one of the his pure continues that, that aren't always all in preflop. So cutting that down, I actually think, like, ace-king might be slightly worse to have here as a bluff than ace-queen. Um, it's, it's probably pretty close, but say he smashes all of his kings in pre, right? 
uh, but he calls most of his queens. It's kind of nice to have a queen in my hand because that's definitely cutting out half of the, the pairs that never fold to my bet and then shove on the river, right? Um, but that logic's kind of a slippery slope. Anyways, I think that me betting the turn all the time is out of line. Um, I also think that C betting ace queen on the flop all the time, like he's getting the flop with a pretty strong range. So it's like not mandatory that I C bet the flop with ace queen either. I could just kind of wave the white flag, check back, but the line seems fine to me. It seems completely reasonable. I mean, it's 220 big blinds each to start. It's like, I know it's absolutely massive, uh, the stakes, but when you think about it, how often do you see like a, like a 2.2 K pot at $2, $5. Like people aren't necessarily freaking out at a 2.2 K pot at $2, $5. And that's, that's what's taking place here, right? I mean, the stakes are gigantic, but the hand in itself is kind of, it's whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think my turn bill is whatever. It's, 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 I think it's good to do sometimes. And you're not just going to get to choose from natural bluffs here all the time because it's a four bet pot and my bluffing, my four betting region is so narrow that it's like, yeah, sure, it would be great to have an open ender here to bluff with. Like, I would much rather have ace four suited and have this like sweet open ender plus my ace isn't out. But you don't always get to flop an open ender in a four bet pot when there's not that much money to be played. And you gotta you gotta pick from bluffs from other places, right? So the flop bets whatever, the turn bets whatever. I don't think either of them are something you do all the time, and I don't think either of them are something you never do. Um, so I third pot the turn. Uh, he calls. Things are getting a little hairy now. And the river's an offsuit ace. Um, and he checks to me. So, shit. <laughs> I rivered an ace. Uh, and there's a lot of money laying out there. And there's 60% pot to play exactly. So not a big bet. I think that if there was like 90% pot to play, my hand would be a much clearer check. I don't think, I think value betting from 90% pot would be like way worse. Do I think that my value bet on the river was too thin? So here's the logic. Do I have the best hand an overwhelming amount of the time? Yes, I definitely do. At this point, I have the best hand a lot. Do I get called by worse? That's the question, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm betting small, and I think that if he's getting to the river with the appropriate amount of hands, and if I'm four betting the appropriate amount of stuff, like if we're treating this like the stakes don't matter, I think that my hand's pretty much always all in on the river. Um, that being said, we're playing one of the biggest cash games ever televised. It's probably the highest stakes game he's ever played in his life. Um, and is he just going to like grab his balls and call it off with pocket jacks here when I shove? That's the question. So I think that in retrospect, you know, I'm trying to, there's, there's a few things. One, when I'm playing a game with players that these stakes are normal for them and they want the pace of the game to continue quite quickly like the Chinese billionaires, right? Uh, it's something I've gotten used to, and it's probably cost me some dollars up front, but is better for my overall being invited to games, being fun to play with, is I usually don't play slow at all in these giant games with, with Chinese uh, players or recreational players that want the – because even though it's a massive pot to us, it's not a massive pot to them, and they just want to get, get on with it, right? Mm -hmm. So – if I could go back, I would have taken an extra 30 seconds and thought really hard about what he's going to call me with. Um, I actually did think that he was the kind of guy that would mix some calls with some, with some, some hero calls, you know, like, like if he gets there with, let's say he three bet, um, anything that's like a bluff catcher, the jacks, the tens, even the pocket nine, or I'm sorry, the pocket nines, the pocket eights, low reach kind of stuff, the five, four suited. Uh, that are like clear get to the river kind of pair open enders. Um, maybe he calls me some. He he just needs to call me half the time for it to be better than a check. Um, and I think that if I do check back here, it's it's going to be pretty easy in theory to hero call my ass if I'm if I'm not value betting this hand on the river. Um, overall, I think that the value bet was too thin in game by a little bit, even though I do think I have a lot of respect for him as a player and I think he's a very good player. And I think that he is capable of making a big call if he needs to. Um, 
And yeah, I think I think that I value cut myself on a spot where it's probably better to check. And I should pure shove ace king if I got there that way because maybe he gets to the river with some ace king. And if that's the case, it's a big disaster for me to value bet. Um, so yeah, uh, slightly too thin, probably not that bad either way. Happened to value town myself in the biggest pot in TV history. So what do you think about that turn sizing you decided to go with? You said you went with one third pot with kind of... um. Yeah, I think that that's so, like I was saying, the mechanic of the flop C bet is on the dry turns where you're basically locked up to win with ace ace or king king, you you have to size down and you you just have like, I, I would only have one turn size on that card. I mean, it's six, five, three rainbow, 10 rainbow, like shoving, uh, shoving the turn doesn't seem nearly as good to me as third potting with whatever your continuing range is and then following through for a third barrel on the river a lot. Um, whereas like, say it's something slightly more dynamic and kind of scary, right? Like six, five, three turn something with a flush draw that now he could have pair plus or open ender plus a side flush draw or shit that you need more protection from, then you can put it in for a little over pot. Um, so my guess is that third pot would be really my only bet size on the turn because ripping for, and I can't remember the size of the pot, but I'm guessing it's like, there's like 1.2 pots to play on the turn. And I think that like ripping with ace ace or king king just seems unnecessary. And all of my other bluffs are just kind of like, not doing so hot against whatever his value range is and me shoving for 1.2. I think he would just pure call jacks or queens on the turn once I've done that. I really think Kane's is going to call with, um, man, with, with worse than jacks, I guess, on that river, huh? That's No, that's what I was saying. I don't think he would, in retrospect, I actually think that my value bet's too thin. And I think that I checking is the superior play in the moment. Although... Just um, in my head, right, whenever I got there, I was like, oh, there's 60% pot to play. I really don't – I mean, if I was value betting kings or queens at this point, I have a way better hand than that now. Um, right. Like, I can't really just value bet top set or ace five suited or whatever, you know. Um, so it just – like, in the 20 seconds that I thought about it, and I should have taken more time, but in the 20 seconds I thought about it, I was just like, other than ace king, this is, this is like the only hand I value bet other than river top set, you know. Um, so it just seemed kind of automatic to me in the moment to shove because I just don't really have better hands other than ace king on the river. Um, but the other part of that equation is what's he going to call me with? And other than ace four suited, which was the, uh, I think two combos, uh, given the, the ace in my hand, other than that, which would snap call me on the river, which was an open ender on the flop and turn and then river to an ace. Other than that, I don't really know what's going to call me other than ace king, which I lose to. So I think, yeah, I think it was a blunder, and I think uh, it was just, yeah, just not not the best play, and I made it. You you you've been in the lab a lot, haven't you? I work hard, man. I can tell your your, your way of uh, explaining things has certainly gotten. I mean, you're always pretty good, but certainly gotten gotten really good, man. You definitely are eloquently explain. Just kind of your ability to express yourself and and these sorts of way. I mean, this is something that takes a while, and it takes a lot of explaining to yourself and to other people to be able to get to this level of just explanation for a decision in a poker hand yeah i mean i i absolutely love the game and you know that i'm just blessed to be around the best people and uh it's 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 been an amazing journey and a good process and i really love learning i mean it's what i do like people ask me like oh what tv show are you watching and i'm like i, I just don't watch tv i don't watch sports i don't go out i i'm either like hanging with bianca or i'm studying poker when i'm not playing and that's all i do yeah <laughs> Yeah, so we're, if you guys don't know, we're talking about Kane Callis. Kane's been playing high stakes, played on a full tilt as NASCAR nineteen forty nine for a very long time, and amazing been, singer, by the way, amazing singer. You got to check that singer. out. He does, yeah, he does the uh, does the national anthems for the Philadelphia Phillies game. His dad is a uh, old school. I think it was a he's an announcer for the Philadelphia Phillies, it's a major league baseball team. And uh, yeah, yeah, Kane's been around really, high stakes really for a long time. Yeah, he's always been a very nice guy, and I've known him since I think I met him two thousand nine or two thousand ten or something like that. So. Yeah, he's, I, I never, I never saw him playing the million dollar buying game, but uh, yeah, I heard about the uh, cryptocurrency stuff as well too. So, he, yeah, uh, he's done all right, I think. He's so, a little richer after me, after me betting the ace. Well, so here's the crazy thing. So you play this hand, you play this one point eight million dollar pot, and then I think it's the next hand or the hand after that. Yeah, it's you like one up, or two hands. I, 
Yeah, it was like then it was it was immediately after that you end up in another big spot, which was a very unusual situation as well too. And just that the line that you took, and then the line that Elton took was even weird. I mean, it just all kind of that yeah. that that's a little freaky of a hand. Yeah, luckily I got the add on on man. I mean, uh, I, I like screamed over the table, "Hey, another million!" And if I wouldn't have gotten that, I would have been short stacked this hand, and I would have just folded six five suited under the gun. Um, but. Since I had a bunch of chips, I got to open it. So I get six five of hearts, uh, UTG six, I think. I think we're six handed. Um, deep, I open it and Tom uh, Juan calls the button. And Elton Sang, who, like we said, is playing $1, $2, uh, calls the big blind. And I believe Elton, Elton certainly covers me. And I think Tom is, I think I have 1.1 million uh, to start. So Tom's like probably around the same stack as me, maybe slightly less. And it comes ace, eight, seven with the eight, seven of hearts. So I flop the open-ended straight flush draw. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, here we go again. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. Um, so uh, checks and I elect to check, which I think being deep against Tom, um, I'm going to favor just really passive lines out of position um, in a lot of circumstances. So I think betting the flop's totally fine. Checking's totally fine. It is really nice for the result to happen in the way that it did where you pick off some dead money. So I check and Tom bets, I think 40% pot roughly. And 24, 24K, 24 call. And then, and then, yeah, I think that's what happened. You remember what the, what, uh, the 24 was into it was probably I think you made it 12.5 K pre or something like that. So then it was two calls plus the ante. So I'm not quite sure. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. 40% pot roughly. Um, and then Elton calls and I raised to um, 1 million Hong Kong or um, sorry, a hundred thousand euros is what people thought it was. So slightly bigger than a hundred thousand euros. Um, Tom hems and haws and then folds. So Tom, that was Tom is ace ten. By the way, here guys, ace ten offsuit. Elton has king seven suited. King seven and diamonds. So it was yeah the eight seven of hearts with the ace of diamonds. And he, I raised to a hundred. Tom folds and then he snap makes it three thirty, I believe, in my face with like one point two to play. Now this is crazy. This is a crazy spot because I'm sitting there and. What line, what hands does he have that he flats Tom with and doesn't just fast play the flop? And I think most of his aces up combos just check raise the flop against Tom. So it's either a set or some kind of big draw. And it doesn't even have to be that big of a draw. That's what, like, you got to reinforce to people. Like, he could just have Queen Jack of Hearts and say, fuck you, let's run it, you know? Like, this guy is rich, like, really rich. And he's totally cool to gamble for a million euros. Like, that's a joke to him. So it's not really – it's a unique situation because he doesn't have, like, the pure combo draws. Like, like say somebody that's taking a reasonable line in his spot. Like, if they're three-betting to play for stacks, they're probably sitting on, like, a set, aces up, or 10-9 of hearts, which has me in a really bad way, you know, or mm -hmm. jack-10 of hearts. So my thoughts are – Shoving the flop is fine because there is a lot of fuckery going on and with Elton, for sure. Um, but calling is pretty sweet in position, too, because if he is just completely donking around and I roll off one of the cards that I'm so often going to roll off, a heart or a straight card, um, he's going to blast it. He's going to keep going. He's going to put me on something like, you know, whatever, ace-king plus backdoor flush draw or something. Um so I think calling is pretty good if you just know in game that the guy's blasting with king seven or whatever. Uh, shoving is probably better on the flop just because picking off the dead money is awesome. Um, but I don't think – I think that if you're playing someone who's trying to play really well, calling in position is the much superior uh, – much yeah, a, a superior play. Um, shoving in this moment, uh, you know, if, if I knew what his range was to three bet the flop, it's probably the best play. Um, but whatever, I was guessing, I called, I just kind of leaned towards what I thought the default play would be. And then the turn is a queen of diamonds, double flush draw. And this is where I really, really could have screwed myself. Um, and it's, you know, when you see the whole cards, I think that it's easy to say, oh, you should have just shoved the flop because now if he shoves the turn for a small over bet, I probably just have to fold. 
And that's a disaster, you know, with my hand, with the class of hand strength that I have. Luckily, he bets like, I think, 390. Um, so I just get to, I get to peel one off again, just getting the price with this hand. And what I was thinking to myself is this is actually a pretty sweet situation for me after he bets this amount, because if he is just kind of committing himself with some kind of big combo heart draw, like, like Jack 10 of hearts or 10, nine of hearts or some other obscure, like whatever King X of hearts or whatever. Um, we can both brick and sometimes he's going to give up and I get to bluff the river and that would be amazing, you know, to just like get to shove six high on the river and he folds King high of hearts or whatever. So I really was, you know, I was thinking to myself, there were a few things, there were some out of body things happening. Uh, me going, all right, well, I might just instantly have to be reloading here for, for another, you know, um, 3 million uh, euros or whatever, or another million euros. Um, but I was just doing my best. I, I've played a lot of pots this big. Um, and it was it's still a very big pot. And the situation, you know, you, you're always – you know, you're always under the judgment anytime you're on TV. You're always under the, the judgment of all your peers and fans and haters. And um, so, yeah, sure, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a part in the back of your head that's going, yeah, I'm going to look like a big idiot here, you know. But I just put that shit to the side and I say, it doesn't matter. Do what you think is right. And that's the way things are going to work. So I call the turn. I think that that's, you know, by far the best play. Shoving and letting him just call off of the dominated heart draw or whatever would be disastrous. Or like in this spot, if I did shove the turn, he would have snapped me with a pair of sevens and the king high flush draw. Um, but I call and then, you know, I'm looking at him. The dealer rolls the card off and I'm looking at him. And I can tell pretty quickly that I don't think he's going to bet the river. So then I look at the river card and I'm like, whoa. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, what well, go through your mind when, when the four, when the offsuit four kind of rolls off there? I, I just I was pretty excited. I'm just watching at home. I can't imagine yeah. playing in the moment there. Yeah, I was thinking like, um, I was thinking to myself like, that's a card. You know that that is a card. Like a heart or whatever. I'm calling it off, but I'm not loving life. You know, uh, even a nine is like uh, whatever. I'm calling it off, but you still lose to the jack ten of hearts or the jack ten of diamonds if he was knocking around with that or whatever. So it's like the offsuit four when you have the invincible nuts, that's a pretty sweet spot, especially in a oh, pot yeah. that size. I'm sitting there going like, damn, this is pretty, this is pretty damn nice. Um, and then he checks and I, uh, yeah, whatever, I shove. And he folds and I was actually really surprised that he folded the hand that he had. Uh, I think the hand that he has, just, give, just given the way that the – it went down, you know, expecting most of my aces up to put it in his face on the turn. And like, really the only value for me to have on the river is like some sets that I didn't just put it in on the turn. Um, which I certainly could have just, yeah, went call call with some sets, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he unblocks hearts and I'm really surprised with that price. He didn't just pay it off. <laughs> yeah. People kind of wondering what other cards would you bluff if, if it was checked to you? I was bluffing the deck. If he checked the river, <laughs> okay, that, that, I, was okay. the deck. I was all in. He would have got me real good if he checked the diamond because I would have been all in for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not checking back six high in that spot when there's third pot to play, I promise you. If you want to somehow three bet the flop and then bet the turn and then pick me off on missed hearts, more power to you, but I'm all in on the river, I promise you that. Mm. That kind of brings me back to something you said a long time ago on the podcast, which was about if you – if you think it's the right play, no matter what the stakes are, you it, you want to get better at just executing and actually following through yeah. in spots like that. I mean, kind of a spot just like that. If check do that, that's something that we we talked about a while ago. Yeah, and I think I think even if you look at the ace queen, um, you know that like we said, it was probably a mistake. But if there's anything, at least I'm saying, hey, you know, all you have in this moment is yourself and your mind and your decision making process. And I believed in that moment that shoving was the right play, and I put in you know, 500,000 euros value towning myself. But hey, if it was a mistake, at least I trusted myself in the moment and I thought it was the best play and I put the money in. It's a lot easier to say, oh, I don't know what to do here. I'm scared. Knuckle it back. You know what I mean? Which, uh, you know, results oriented, that would have been the right play. But I'm just happy that uh, I'm listening to myself and trying to do what I think is right in the moment. And that's that. Well, 
listening to yourself has gotten you to this point. So I think that, I mean, while it might be wrong sometimes, it's more right than wrong very often. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, hey, you know, we've all been doing this for a long time, and I think the reason that we're all sitting here and still making a good living at it is because uh, there's intangible things that we do that keep us around. And am I perfect? Absolutely not. Are there better no limit holding players than me? Absolutely. Um, but you know, I'm I'm uh, I feel very good about where I'm at in this moment as a player, and um, I'm at a level that I never thought I would be at. Hmm. It's awesome, man. It's really good to hear. I mean, it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty wild to see kind of what consistent work ethic and consistent focus, consistent time in the lab, playing. I mean, traveling. It's just yeah, it's it's really cool to kind of see what results can come not only in tournaments but in cash games too. I think sometimes people are cash games or tournaments, but you're you're doing both. You're out there playing cash games and tournaments and having success at yeah, both I, of them. Now. I definitely play more cash games and tournaments. Um, even though you know, uh, I'm I, I'm publicly known as a tournament player, and that's great, and it's something that you know got me to the point that I'm at. But in this day in my life, you know, there were two 25ks this week at the Aria. I I, I couldn't play them. You know, um, there there are reasons. Uh, like I was saying earlier, you only get so much energy and you have to pick the best spots possible. And right now, the best spots for me oftentimes are cash games. So, so for the session, I saw that I saw you. It was reported that you might have been down some money, but I, I'm pretty sure you're up money in that session. Right. So you ended up winning money, I think, overall. On yeah, yeah I, won a, I won a little over 200,000 U.S. that session. Um, yeah, it was I, I saw a couple of things, too, like. Like, you know, obviously there's always trolls, but even even some uh, poker media outlets were like, good thing Jason won that poker tournament. He got himself out of the hole of, of losing um, in the cash game. And I was thinking, man, if you just like look at the even, you know, the cash game didn't end when the TV program ended. But even if you looked at when the TV program ended, I believe I was up like 100K euros or something. So uh, it's whatever. But yeah, the session went well. The week went well. Uh, cash games fortunately went well that week. And, um, yeah, I somehow, you know, it, I lost a 220 big blind stack. Uh, you're going to do that a lot in poker tournaments and sometimes it's going to be for 2 million euros and <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I won that session. Occasionally my friends out there in the chat, it will be for 2 million euro. That is, uh, yeah, that's uh, fair. I guess people. All other question people had is how much do people ha first have in themselves in these games? Jason is Jason playing for hundred percent, thirty percent, two percent? I mean, you you obviously you've seen this out there too. The discussion, the chatter. I, what do you what do you kind of think I, about that chatter when people are talking about things like that? I think that everyone's business is their own, but I promise you one thing: people that are playing these games almost certainly have enough skin in the game that it really matters to them, and people are playing bigger stakes than. There was this thing, I don't know when it started, I guess it happened whenever people started playing high roller tournaments at first and a lot of the younger guys uh, weren't, weren't able to have big bankrolls yet because they were 22 years old or whatever, unless they were Fedor. So they, they were playing these tournaments for experience and for fun and notoriety and a small piece of themselves. But that isn't always the case. And I'll tell you, uh, I feel the heat. I promise you that. I feel the burn when I play. And the stakes are very, very, very real to me. And um, the stakes are much bigger than anyone's playing online. I promise you that. Would you say? Would you say you're? Uh, you think you're maybe have too big a piece in yourself, and maybe some of these games to the point where you know you maybe a couple losing sessions and it might set you back a little bit, or do you no. feel like you're? Okay. No, I'm, I'm very responsible with that. Um, in the beginning, I wasn't, but that was because I thought that my earnings, future earnings were much higher than my current net worth. And I, I was like, oh, whatever, I can recover quickly. Um, you know, and the stakes just like, even though they were huge to me at the time, I thought that shot taking was necessary and prudent because even though I was only at a specific figure, I, I just guesstimated that in the future I, I would be in better spots and have a lot more money. And fortunately that's the case. Mm. So Tyler Short asks a, a pretty good question, even though I, I think I, I would suspect what your answer is. Tyler says, does it bug him at all thinking about the burned EV when making mistakes at the high stakes? All those mistakes obviously cut into your win rate and easy to beat yourself up over mistakes costing a lot of money. Yeah, for me to, uh, for me to say that whenever I screw something up, it doesn't bother me. Um, 
that would just be a blatant lie. Like I, I lose sleep over, over making a mistake. And I think that that's one of, you know, it's, it's a, it's a life leak of mine. I do think it's important to be able to let go of things, but it's also one of the reasons I'm here. Uh, it really, really bothers me to screw something up, but in a lot of unique scenarios with a lot of, a lot of different elements happening all in the moment at once, it's kind of hard to quantify unless you really, really have a huge blunder. It's kind of hard to quantify how good or bad something was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's a spot where you just put your stack in pre with queen six suited or something and run into aces for 300 big blinds each, sure, that was just ridiculous and you torched it, you know. But if there's a spot that it's just, there's a lot of varied opinions. And um, like I said, for instance, like the ace queen hand, I think that um, a check was the superior play. There were a lot of elements. And with my limited amount of time, I didn't beat myself up that bad about that one because I was just like, there's a lot of shit happening there, man. There's a two and a half big line ante. There's a lot going on. And I screwed up, but have I made bigger mistakes? I probably made 10 bigger mistakes that week than that hand. <laughs> Are you sure? I mean, I don't know. It wasn't that big of a mistake, to be honest with you. But yeah, that's what I mean. It, it really wasn't. It wasn't that. I don't think it was that big of a torch. I think it was a mini torch. And I've, I've, I had some big torches for sure. All right, so let's talk about the the, the, the short deck. So obviously, short deck now is kind of popping on the scene. We've heard about this game for a long time. Over that's going yeah. on over nation, and now we're finally got a chance to kind of see some of it on stream. So you play, I think there were two two of the tournaments, and you finished first in uh, in one of them for three point. It's like a hundred million dollar Hong Kong, but three point five million US or something like that. And I was looking at that on the Hendon Mob today. So the short deck game. So are you kind of popping in there? What, what's kind of been your experience with short deck so far? Uh yeah, I, I just noticed that you know it was kind of taking um, taking China by storm, and I just figured, hey, you know, this is something that you know there may be tournaments at one day, and there also may be some decent cash games. And most of the really good cash games are private, and you're never going to be able to play them. I'm never going to be able to play them, but it it's a fun variant. Um, it's it's more similar to PLO, uh, so I think you would like that than than No Limit in a lot of ways. It's it's and I think eventually the game may just be a pot limit game, and that would be fun. Um, but I saw that there were going to be some tournaments in the future, and I said, hey, these things are probably going to be pretty good. Um, and tournaments are weird in any time. Like okay, so I'm I'm shit at PLO, but I still play PLO tournaments because I think they're fun, and you know I'll play that. Uh, the World Series PLO tournament or, or whatever. And the, the one thing that you see is equities run really close together in that game, but yet a lot of medium stacks still find a way to get all in pre hand for hand on the bubble with aces, you know? And that's just like, whoa, do not do that. You know, like, like you're basically locked up for a cash, but you still find a way to get your money in with whatever, 61% equity on the bubble with aces in a PLO game. Um, and that is extreme in, in this game. Like one, it's a no limit game. So you can just put the stack in on the flop. You can put the stack in pre flop. And a lot of these guys are just going to say, you know, fuck it, let's run it. I have two Kings, uh, and put the money in on the bubble and just torch, absolutely torch an ICM. So I realized, Hey, you know, I could probably just play kind of tight on these bubbles if I'm short and, and make some money there. And I understand the way that like, short stacks play and which hands you use in specific situations because I've played a lot of tournaments and there's a lot of variant stack sizes. And even though I'm a total noob at the game, I thought that I could, one, it would be fun to learn and play. And two, I could generate some EV just with my tournament and uh, varying stack uh, knowledge. And I think that was the case. Do I think that uh, I was one of the best players in that field, like of the main that I won? No, nah, I don't. I definitely don't. There are guys that are have two years of experience playing, you know, like Tom and Ivy and the guy that I got heads up with is just a phenomenal player, especially deep. I played some of the cash games with him and he's just like sick. I mean, super sick. And you wouldn't believe the amount of money this guy, like I'm talking, you know, sit down and win 8 million us in a session and get up and go have a cigar and come back like that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so these guys are like some, there's some serious ballers out there. And, uh, but yeah, it's been fun for me. It's not something I'm an expert at, but it's something that I, I kind of set parameters for myself. And I said, "Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put myself in the really marginal situations, and I'm just gonna be kind of a nit and figure it out." And that's what I've done. Yeah, I think most people when they go play a new game, they they go the opposite. They're like, "I'm gonna go play PLO for the first time. I'm gonna play crazy because I see everyone else play crazy." And a lot of times, you you want to play 
tight and learn how to play tight and then maybe start opening up slightly before you, you know, like i feel like people jump into the extreme version of loose and i'm like well you probably want to yeah, no that's that's definitely not going to work in that game especially they're going to throw you in the beat grinder if you start going to flops turns and rivers against dur or somebody they're just they just have too much experience so what do we think about this uh i'm surprised that a variant like this a cash game variant hasn't gotten more popular in the past years it just it would make sense that maybe people would play no limit they might get a little bored they play pop Omaha, they might get a little bored i'm not sure how yeah. and then a new variant might come up so it seems like this is something that is kind of taking the poker world a little bit by um you know by storm and, and people seem excited to want to play it do you think it has any possibility of being something that actually catches on a little bit more mainstream in america and, and maybe rest of the world as well I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, the reason why is because I don't think it's a that good of a game. Um, it's preflop. It's much simpler. Um, it's much simpler preflop. And there's a lot of just blasting it. Um, and then post flop, it's, it is like deep. It's difficult and very complicated in a lot of scenarios, but it's, it's just like full deck no limit is so hard and so much fun and there are so many unique spots and then in this short deck sorry something popped up on my screen in short deck there's just like okay i'm here i guess i'm all in um and that happens a lot I, so i think because the game is simple and because the game is the variance of the game is much higher than plo i think that like fish may like it but I just don't see it catching mainstream traction. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I played a little bit of it. Me and Sasha played some heads up, and I think I pwned her up. But uh, it was kind of fun. I mean, I don't know. I don't play much, you know, two card pot Lenoir these days. But I, that's, yeah. I did I did beat you for sure. What are you talking about? No, she's uh she said it's not true. But yeah, it was fun. I don't know. It was it was kind of cool. Like I like playing hands, and I don't know how that would work in a full ring setting. It seems like I don't know if it's, what's the max number. Full ring is terrible. Full ring is bad. Mm. Uh. Because it's like, you know, it's I imagine full ring PLO is terrible too. Like somebody just has aces a lot and you're enough. sitting there being a nit. That's that's the exact same in this game. It's just like there people have too many good hands and you just get the pile in your face too often. So what's the kind of like playing with, um, you know, kind of seeing playing with Durr? I don't know if you've been playing with Durr a lot. Obviously, yeah. he is a, a, a something of the poker world. They love him. They're fascinated by him. They miss him. They wonder where he's been. It kind of looked like he's been playing poker for – uh, I don't know, hours and hours and hours straight. I don't know if he sleeps. Like, I'm not sure. Like, where, what the hell happens with this guy, man? Yeah, he plays like two days straight, and then he'll sleep a day, and then he'll play two days straight. Um, Tom's great, man. He's uh, he's doing great. He's he's absolutely killing it. Um, he's such a likable, likable guy. I can see why he's he's been accepted in the by the Chinese in the poker community. He really does have a larger than life personality, and he's really. Um, yeah, he's just a warm dude. He, he really is. And, uh, you know, he's – and he's just a sick degenerate in a lot of ways too. Like he's the guy that's just like – he'll all, whatever stakes you want to play, he's always good to play it. Like it doesn't matter, you know. Um, and that's really is true about him. It's just like you said it, and he'll sit down and play. It doesn't matter. Bigger, better, whatever. You want to play 100K, 200K US, let's do it, you know. Um, he's just – he's that kind of level of, of sick. And, and he's also a very good gambler. So – he gives people action. They like that. He's warm and fun to play with. He plays fast. He's, I mean, playing fast is really important, especially in those games. And uh, yeah, and he's just loose, man. He's uh, Tom's, Tom's killing it. So I guess when you go and play in these games, it, it sounds like you, you kind of want to bring a social, uh, bring some social to the table. You want to play fast. You want to, I guess, en just engage. Like, is there some sort of different way you're going to play that than if you're going to play the 300K Super High Roller Bowl this weekend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one, there's obviously a language barrier unless you can speak Mandarin. And so you have to offer other things. You have to either be action, you have to be pleasant, and you have to speed the game up for them. Because if you're playing fast and you're moving with them and you're giving them action and you're smiling or laughing occasionally, and I do enjoy it. I'm like naturally laughing my ass off half the time because those dudes are so funny. Their celebrations are hilarious and they're slow rolling each other all the time and just doing gnarly shit to each other, you know. Um, so I, I really enjoy it. Uh, the stakes are insane. And sometimes like by the end of the night, you're just sitting there going like, did that just happen? Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But, uh, yeah, I think that if you're sitting there staring at these guys and taking 40 seconds of decision, you're just never going to be invited to play again. And at Super High Roller Bowl, when you're playing against every person there is there for blood and they're all kind of, you know, randomizing their decisions and studying your your pupil dilation or whatever this bullshit is they all think they're doing. Um, sure, you're going to play slower, you know? <laughs> Wait, are you not are you not up on the current uh, pupil dilation study trends or it's what? Like, bro, look at my pupils all day long, please. If you pick me off on a pupil dilation read, I deserve to be out of the tournament. Is there a, who's the top pupil dilated dilation reader in the in the? Is it Fedor? Is this uh, is, is uh, studying that in prime mind or what, what? Who's been who's the top dilation pupil guy? Man, I I, I really don't know. I like a, a couple years ago, I was just like, you know what? I'm just owning it, like if you want to stare at my body and I'm not saying there's not something to it, <laughs> you want to stare at my neck or my, my eyeballs or the way my fingers are moving, be my guest, but I'm, I'm playing a game, you know, and your biceps really, and your, they're staring at your biceps, Jay Coon. Listen, that's what happens when you're working yeah, on too much money. They're staring, staring at the biceps, whatever it is. It's like, look, I, I, we've all been here, you know, we've been here a long time and I'm going to be okay if you bust me from the tournament. I'm going to be just fine. So if you think that looking at me and there's like some kind of like personal dialogue going on in my head, like, oh, my God, I hope he doesn't call me. It's just not happening. You know, if if I'm all in, I'm either one thinking about my decision or two thinking about what I'm going to have for dinner. You know, I'm not. It's just I don't feel it inside anymore. I don't. Hmm. So people are saying Vogel saying you, you think Vogel saying is Vogel saying invited to the private game with the with the Asian guys? I, I don't know if he's gonna get. I don't think he's gonna get into the game. Oh my I god! I, okay, I love Kristoff, but I have an amazing Kristoff story. This is like one of the best stories. Uh, okay, so in uh, Macau, like last year, we all finished playing this uh, this their main event, like their high roller tournament, and one of the guys. Really awesome guy that uh, wing thirty three on stars. He's always playing like fifty one hundred. His name's like Shan something. So funny this guy. He's just always talking. But he's like, hey, let's uh, let's go play three hundred k sit and goes. So like thirty seven thirty nine k us sit and goes. And we were like, all right, yeah, sure. And he's like, I got a buddy, like another Chinese guy, like he wants to play with you guys. Sure. So we all sit down, and it's like Christoph, me, Ike, and then like two Chinese dudes, and maybe like. Uh, Maybe like Makita or somebody. And um, so Shan's like, hey, guys, uh, you know, this is a friendly sit and go. But just to speed it up, let's 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 use shot clock since we got one here. Let's use a shot clock. We're all like, yeah, sure. Absolutely. And Kristoff is like, no, I thought this was friends game. You know, I thought this was friends game. Why do we have a shot clock? And uh, and the guy's like, look, let's just run the shot clock. And Kristoff's like, OK, whatever. We'll play a friendly game, friends game. And the first hand, they <laughs> they deal the cards, and I like look at my hand, I muck, and I look over to Kristoff on my left and our friends game sit and go, and he's got his his hoodie zipped shut where you can only see this part of his face, and he's got his blue shark optics on underneath. He's playing the friends game sit and go zipped up. I was like, come on, you're giving this guy shit about a shot clock, and your face is zipped up with sunglasses on. Was the most absurd thing I've ever seen. Did he? But did I he love Chris. He's a nice he, guy. Ever. He playing like this, or did he take it off? What was he doing? I don't know. Did, he kept it on. He kept it on. Kristoff was there. Wow. Was he invited back to play more of these friends games after that, or what? Oh, you're kind of fading on me. Uh -oh. Hold on a second. See if it comes back. Do 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 do. Yeah, it lagged a little bit. Yeah, we got some lag. Do you want to like restart this, or can we not do that? Um, we can just um, if you want to close out and come back on, it should be it should my my end should be fine. Are you on Wi-Fi over there? Yeah, here, hold up. Let me. Uh, I'll just shut it down and call you right back. Okay, I'll get some shout outs here. Who we got in the chat? I hear boys. Wayne Shang, my guy Wayne. What up, buddy? What's happening, man? Zachary Weatherford. What's up, Zach? Error Eliminator. Kyle Mohorski. Vogel saying now invited confirmed. I, I'm, I'm not inviting that guy to my game. I don't know about y'all, man. My man Harbs is in the chat. What up, Harbs? What's happening, brother? What's going on, man? I saw Sasha in there earlier. What's up, Sasha? What's happening, Sasha? I don't see her commenting too much, though. She's busy right now. Lauren Malvoy, what's up, puppy? What's happening, man? Alex Babbitts, what up, Alex? What's going on, brother? Chris P., Adam Boy, DJ, Louis V., 
Joseph Arsenat. Who else we got, man? Let me go through some of these names in here. I see a bunch of familiar names as always in the chat. Thanks, everybody out there for tuning in live. Ferrans, Mikel, Roasted T, Chris Slade. What's up, Chris? Babyface, ATL, Tony Tamayo, Mads Frey. What up, Mads? Xiao Zhang. What up, pup? Hey. Chris M. Bogner. Back. Back. Boom. Okay, cool. Cocaine. Yeah. Colombian cocaine. What up, Colombian cocaine? What up, Poppy? What's going on, brother? Liking, uh, liking that name. It's an interesting name out there, buddy. Interesting name. So we said Vogel <laughs> saying he's not... He is was he invited back to another game after that, or was what like was I actually can't remember. I know the guy really likes Kristoff, but he was mildly annoyed at that. Yeah, I'd be annoyed in the friend in the friends game if a guy's wearing a fucking hoodie over half of his face and, and wearing his blue shark optic glasses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was pretty absurd. So it sounds like overall the, the trip was a fun trip, and, and now you're back in the United States. You're preparing for Super High Roller Bowl. We got the hundred k going on tomorrow. What's kind of your um, what's kind of the plan here coming up for this uh, for this few weeks for the High Roller tournaments kind of going on? Um, yeah, man. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to beat myself down this year. I, I'm I'm stoked to play that tournament. It's going to be a good tournament. I got some good pieces as well, so it's going to be a fun gamble for me. Um, but yeah, it's uh. I, I'm really, uh, really excited to play, but I'm just uh, kind of scouting around, trying to get my value here and there. And this summer, my most important focus is just to be, to enjoy it, to be in good physical health and, and to enjoy it and make some money too, but not beat myself down too hard. Hmm. So not much poker, it sounds like maybe some, um, some of the, some of the tournaments and, and maybe some cash games if they go off, but kind of not much poker, it seems like. Man, I'm bummed. This uh, this this thing is fading in and out on me super hard. I don't know what to do. Is it? Did you try um? Did you try turning off your Wi-Fi and turning it back on? Uh, no. I will try that. Um, okay. Also have a backup just in case. I think. All right. Yeah. Give that a shot, and uh, that might. You get shout outs. I'll be right back. Okay. You guys are lucky. We get more shout outs here. Carlos Villa. What up, Carlos Papi? What's going on, man? What's happening, Mark Rubin? What's up, Mark? Pete Peterson, go Poppy. What's going on, Pete? What's happening, buddy? Papito, Papinga. My buddy Gus P in the chat. What up, Gus? KC Grombacher. What up, KC? What's happening, man? What's happening? Who else we got in here? Zion and Jules. I don't know what that means. Error elimination, eliminator. I don't know what that means either. Matt Forsyth. Forsyth? 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 I'm not sure how you say that last name. Robert Specht. What's up, Robert? What's happening, buddy? Estonian Jesus. Okay. Louis V, TDT574, you know me, 13, what up, Poppy? Mucho Poker, yeah, yo, so much love from Panama, Poppy. What up, Mucho Poker? What's going on, man? Sean Mullen, another favorable podcast. Shout out to my man, Andrew Nimi. Shout out to Phil Galfon. We got some uh, collaborations kind of in the works with Andrew Nimi and, uh, and me and Phil Galfon reported about five videos the other day, guys. It'll be out. Um, start putting those out next week. We're also going to be doing some Super High Roller Bowl content as well, kind of recaps after Super High Roller Bowl that goes on next week, too. So, if you watch this Super High Roller Bowl and you want to hear it discussed or a little bit of, um, you just want to hear more about the action and kind of someone talking about it, I'll be putting out videos the day after those uh, the High Roller Bowl happens because I always feel that way whenever I watch something. I want to hear other people discuss it. So I figured I'll put that out and uh, I'll be watching it. So it'll be fun. Leighton Autry, love is the wisdom in the podcast. Thank you, Leighton. I love the wisdom as well, too, my friend. Let's see what else we got out here. Squirrel Master. What's up, Poppy? What's happening? Dustin Morsberger. Hola, Poppy. Hola, cola, mosa, caramola, cita. Neil Siv. What up, Neil? Dave Anderson. Bo Hoobs. Alex Crypto. Glad to be Vlad. I'm so GTO, man. We got a lot of people out here, man. What's going on, everybody? Let me go zoom. Let me go zoom back down. We're waiting for Jay Coon right now. He's got some uh, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi issues currently taking place at the moment in time. So, uh, so yeah. Gus says, can we split a bottle of Patron or 1942 next week, Poppy? We can split something, uh, Gus, if you want to split. I'm not sure what we're going to split, but we could definitely split something. Um, I don't know what, what we're going to be, though. Sherwin M says, JRB on the podcast, Poppy. We could have JRB on the podcast some point in time, guys. I feel like the podcast is is um, we're backed up a little bit on people I want to have on. There's about 100 people I want to have on. And, um, and yeah, but I'm not going to do 100 in a week. So I think the list of people I, I want to have on is certainly... Yeah, it's pretty long. It's pretty long for sure. Michael Mish Novik, what up, papi? Cola mona la la cita. What's up, buddy? What's happening, man? What's going on? Car Carbon FX Trader, what's going on? Nova Poker Player, worst apology I've ever seen. We're going to talk more about the Chris Ferguson when Jason gets back in here. If you're watching this 
if you're watching this on um, back on replay, just kind of scoot ahead and see if we got past this part. And um, and yeah, but if you're watching this live and you're going to stick with us here for a couple seconds, then uh, then keep sticking with us as we continue to give some shout outs. But yeah, we're going to talk about the Chris Ferguson video next. I also have a video coming out tomorrow about the Chris Ferguson video. And um, <laughs> I mean, my God, whatever it was, it, it kind of is what it is. So uh, someone mentioned about getting Harala Bob on a podcast. I just talked with Harala Bob and um, not going to do a podcast right now, but we might do a podcast maybe sometime in the future. We'll kind of see what happens with that. Franz Mikel says awesome podcast so far. I agree. Jason has been um has been making it awesome. So I'm gonna give all props to Jason on this one. Sicario 0731. What's up, Sicario? What's happening, buddy? Binks Poppy, have you heard from the fort lately? I have heard from the fort, and it seems like he's doing uh, pretty well over in Toronto. So that's very good to hear. Royal Rosario, my man, Royal. What's up, brother? He says, What book are you reading right now, Poppy? I am reading what I mean, what's kind of the book I'm reading? I'm not sure what the main book. I feel like I got about a three, about 30 books I'm reading right now that I sort of go through on a daily basis. I'll kind of rotate through the one, books. So. One time. Boom. Is he back? Maybe. We'll see. Did the let's full see. reboot. All right. Let's hope that works. Let's uh let's hope. All right, we gave that was a record length for shout outs right there. That was a record length for shout outs. But I'm good. David Mueller, I'm good. I'm good. Everyone got their shout out. Good. Everyone got a shout out. All right, good. Someone said that poppy shit is gay. Um, first of all, that's weird that you say that. I look at it as a term of endearment. I consider pop poppies out there our friends. We're all friends together. A lot of poppies out there, papicos, papingas. It is what it is, buddy. Okay. Yeah, and it's like, yo, if it is gay, fuck off. Who cares? I know. I don't it's know. It's fine. <laughs> Been using it for years, man. It is what it is. Like we I don't know. I kinda it's it's fun. It's fun to say, man. It's kinda I like mixing it up. So, Jason, you saw this Chris Ferguson apology video, right? That was outrageous. So, if you guys didn't know, Chris Ferguson, uh, he was involved in the po full tilt poker Ponzi scheme where they took hundred billion dollars from the poker players out there, and uh, he finally released a video, forty-three second video, a, a legend apology or a message to the community, and he was sort of reading off a cue card. He was in a very robotic tone. It looked like he may have been held at gunpoint, hostage, while he's reading this uh this apology and, and jason as somebody who played a lot in full tilt you know what was kind of i mean i just kind of what's what's your what's your view on this video of this response seven years after the fact uh, of yeah. trying to get in the good graces of the poker world it, it definitely obviously it changed my life it changed everybody else's life too um but yeah i just think it was the most half-assed apology you could ever you could ever make like i'm sorry that i couldn't prevent black friday like we're not we're not saying to apologize for that. We're saying you're sorry for being instrumental and in, uh, all of us being robbed and not doing anything about it or standing up for it and, and just pocketing loads and loads of money and then just trying to show your face like nothing happened. Uh, it's not about preventing Black Friday. Like if our government was going to screw us over, that's fine, but at least have some integrity about it. Yeah, I mean, what do you kind of think about this waiting seven years to put out a video? And and obviously he was at the World Series last year. He won the player of the year. And I, I guess now he kind of put this video out there to potentially draw some heat off of himself because I know he received a lot of negative backlash last year and debatably rightfully so. Whether, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly the tone or the way people did do it, but I mean, it's pretty crazy like to come back and then be like, okay, everything's going to be fine. You haven't talked about this and you were a very instrumental part. And now, you know, Phil Helmy put out a tweet that said, Oh, here's Chris's apologies. Like the haters are gonna find out one day that what really happened, and all this kind of stuff like that. And mm -hmm. you gotta understand, Phil, that the haters are people who had millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars stolen <laughs> from them for many years and changed their lives. And and some people ruined their lives when this happened. These are the haters that are upset that Chris hasn't really come out and said anything, or really anyone's come out and said anything. And and if Phil Helmuth has inside information about what happened with the full tilt poker story, then I mean, I don't know. It sounds like he should maybe share share some information with the people yeah, out there. It's like, it's like yo, yeah. if, if you're getting haters and you know something, then just stand up and say, well, you know, clear clear your uh, clear what we're accusing you of and, and prove that you're not a part of it. You know, like I, I uh, I'm not sure who who had the biggest part to deal with it other than that Ray Vitar guy. But it's like you're basically guilty until proven innocent if you're part of that scumbag organization and then just step up. And and showed us why you shouldn't be ostracized from the poker community. Yeah, I, I doesn't. I, I don't know why you can't have some sort of actual meaningful apology where you're not writing it down, you're not reading off of something. Why it takes He's seven absurd. years? Like, yeah, I, I just it, it's kind of mind blowing that this would have been the plan of attack or the option 
for the Chris Ferguson team out there. And, I, and, I, and I'm not saying a lot of people out there talking about they want to forgive him too. And, and I, I'm kind of the same. I mean, I don't want to be have hostile hostility against somebody like that, or I don't want to be feeling like that type of way against someone like that. And I, I like to forgive any everyone at some point in time. But I mean, yeah, this this whole situation, dude. This was this was a, a the biggest Ponzi scheme in, in poker history. It was just such yeah. a such a scam by these guys and to come out and say like oh it was these guys they did nothing wrong it was the government and oh i mean come on guys you know it's, just no, really it's outrageous and like man those dudes knew that shit was coming like they they did that's just a fact they knew like a lot of those guys knew i'm not saying everybody knew for sure but like some of those guys knew they were at least tipped off there was some stuff that wasn't right from within that organization i can promise you that um you know, I've heard a couple of people say, you know, Chris doesn't deserve this. He's a good dude. He, he wasn't part of it. I'm not saying he was like an instrumental part of it or not. Like, I don't know, but prove, prove it, man. You know, like obviously somebody was a part of it. Right. They were just making it rain. You know, those guys just running around printing hundred K a month. Like, dude, it, it was nuts. Like we would sit around and play five. I was playing five K heads up, sit and goes against red pros. Like they were just all in dark. Like these guys just torching it. It was just free money, you know, like. It was insane. Like Mattisell is just playing 200, 400 against the legends, just punting, you know? Somebody was making money. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy. We really haven't heard anything from anybody about this. Like none of the full tilt red pros. I mean, no one really in the poker world, it seems like. And it kind of seems like in a way there's a changing of the guard in the poker world where a lot of these people that may have been ambassadors before, you know, they're still known in the poker world, but there's like a new crop of player like someone like yourself that's coming to the forefront that that's an ambassador. You have even some of these guys who are uh, Andrew Nimi, a video blogger guy who who is a, a kind of becoming a poker ambassador. You have me or Doug with with the podcast and with the videos kind of like that. And when I look back at at some of these poker ambassadors of, of years prior, it just seems like a very fucked up state, man. It really does. It seems like there's so much just like I don't really know how to what the word I'd use to describe it. It just seems fucking crazy kind of oh. looking back at what kind of what went down and what happened and and yeah, I mean, but to be fair, to be fair, let's like how what could you really expect? This is this is what happened. There were a bunch of dudes and women sitting around in Vegas, gambling, betting sports, smoking cigs, hanging out in these poker rooms, just playing whatever limit, whatever game they could go play at Bobby's room, angling each other, which was like part of the just part of the culture, you know. Um, and none of those people were even slightly famous. You know, maybe they were in like the local poker rooms or whatever. But then the next thing you know, this massive influx of money comes in from this dude winning the main event on ESPN. And every Joe Schmo in poker that was making money at the time is a celebrity. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine. So it's not really like you're handpicking like people that were that were equipped to be famous, you know? Like at this point, there's more of a filtering process because it's really, really hard to win at poker. And you've got to do a lot of things now. Like if you, you know, if you're down down in Bobby's room, uh, sticking aces up your sleeve and cheating, you're instantly out of the poker community. Or if you rob from somebody or oversell a piece of yourself or whatever, you're done. Like back then that was normal shit. Like I heard a story recently of, it's like a, it's a funny story. Negrano always tells it of like, there, it was like, I can't remember the guys, but let's just say it was like two grizzled, like, like poker, poker players back in the day. And like one walks into the bathroom and, and Bellagio and posts up and starts pissing in the urinal. And it's like, Hey, how you doing in the tournament? All right, cool. You want to swap 10%? Sure. The other guy walks out and then a guy comes out of the stall and says, yo, that guy busted at my table. Like, like 30 minutes ago, he's not even in the tournament. And the other guy laughs and says, I didn't even play the tournament, you know? So like, they're both just like scumming each other. And it was just like completely normal back then. People laughed about that shit. So it's just like, a, it's a different world. So like, yeah, there was definitely some scummy people, but I think it was to be expected, man. It, it wasn't like, they were just normal people trying to, trying to make a living gambling. And then they were just boom, famous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. Uh, I guess when you think about being a, a poker ambassador, you know, how how important do you do you take this idea, and how important? I guess, like, what do you think about yourself when it comes to being a poker ambassador? So, with me personally, leaving a legacy in poker, I don't care. I don't care to ever be famous. I don't care to ever be known as like one of the greatest no limit hold'em players or greatest gamblers. I don't care. I want to. 
I want to have a great life. I want to make a good living for my family, my future kids, for future wife, my mom. I want to provide a good life for everybody. I want to enjoy my time here. And in the, the greatest gift of all is I've got to become friends with the most impressive, intelligent, talented people uh, with the highest integrity. And that all came to me through poker. Um, and this is like poker is always going to be this thing that I cherish. And, and it took a, a poor kid that was 100K in debt for school and a surgery and gave me a good life and gave my family a good life. And that's really like my own legacy to myself. But I don't, as an ambassador, I want to be somebody people can respect and I want to do the right thing and I want to play well. And, you know, it, yeah, it means a lot to me to people, for people to say, oh, this guy is like executing well and doing a good job. But like, that's not my identity. You know, it's, it's not my job to shape my image so the community thinks I'm cool or so people like, are like, whoa, this guy's valuable um, and uh, I would love to follow him on Twitter or meet him or, or do this or that. It's like, cool, whatever. Like, if you, if you like what I'm about, that's great. But other than that, man, if you get caught up in that shit, you're, you're just melt your brain. Hmm. Guys in the chat, let's get a couple questions out here for Jason. So you you playing? So you only playing tournaments? You're playing are are the hundred k and three hundred k? And and is that going to be all the poker you have planned for right now? Yeah, I'm going to play the million dollar one drop. Um, I'll play the fifty k no limit World Series event. I'll play the three hundred k. Um, I'll play the main event, and other than that, I'll probably be playing cash games. The uh, the cash games are about to uh, about to kick up, I believe. I mean, I think there's already been a lot of a lot of action at high stakes in uh, in Bobby's room, but I know when summer comes, it, I don't know, it just kind of freaks out. And you never know what really goes, you never know what really is going to happen. And uh, yeah, are you excited? Are you excited to play more cash games, or are you are you maybe looking forward to maybe taking a little bit more of a break and and just kind of relaxing, and spending time with your girl and spending time with friends? I got about half of that, um, but I think I know what you're saying. You're kind of asking me what the plans are looking like. Is that right? Yeah, more just so like, are you excited to maybe not play as much poker this year, this summer? I oh, am, yeah, man, because there's a lot more poker for me at the end of uh, at the end of the summer, and uh, I'll be heading back to Asia to play. And um, you know, and there's a, there's always a lot of action. Um, so anytime I can get, and I like this this trip, I lost like nine pounds. It's just, you just play, you eat like one meal a day and I don't eat carbs when I play poker because it just slows down my brain. So I basically went there and ate half the calories that I normally eat and only got to work out three times in two weeks and I just lost a ton of weight. Uh, so getting home and getting to put that back on and get to feeling better physically and, um, and yeah, do some, you know, the more live poker you play, the rustier you get at mechanical stuff. So it's kind of fun to just be at home and study study stuff to help you execute better when you actually do play. Coit says, does Kuhn only run Sims on Pio? <laughs> does Kuhn only do what? Does Kuhn only run Sims on Pio? Son of a bitch. I'm calling you back on uh, a different internet connection. I'll be right back. Okay. One more, one more piece of shout outs, guys. Jay Kuhn's internet. I don't know what's going on. Sometimes this kind of things happens with the Google Hangouts and that kind of stuff. So one more round of shout outs and uh and then yeah that's it all right i think i've given literally given everybody a shout out we have a man named bitcoin in the chat who says buy bitcoin all right calm down bitcoin calm down please calm down my friend who else we got mahish pun what up mahish what's going on brother what's happening man lauren malvoy i'm just giving people another shout out whatever it is what it is a dibs music nation jay coon is a real good dude a real great dude respect definitely would agree with that i feel like i've given everybody a shout out so far lauren Deutsch, what up lauren what's happening brother What's going on, man? Who else needs a shout out out here today? It's your chance. I'm, I might never give a shout out again. Ted, don't, Todd, don't play. What up, Todd? Don't play. Felipe Vegas. What up, Felipe Venegas? What's going on, brother? Ike Ant Carr. What up, Ant? Jermaine Johnson. What's up, poker dude? What's up, poker Jermaine? What's going on, brother? Jamie Burry. What up, Jamie? M Nix 5. Sam Renshaw. What up, Sam? What's going on, brother? Hope the Pop Omaha streets are treating you well. Matthew Kecky. Much love, Poppy. Podcast legend. What's up, my. Matthew, 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 Kekoi, Kiki. I don't know say your name. I apologize, man. Levi Giles, first time here. What up, dudes? What up, Levi? What's going on, man? What's happening, Poppy? Welcome to uh, welcome to the podcast live. Olivier Sane. What up, Olivier? Bob Wend. What up, Big Bob? What's happening, Bobby? <laughs> Alan Ivan. What's up, Alan? Alan, 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 Alan Ivan. What's going on, man? Alan Tally. What up, Big Poppy? Alan, what's going on, brother? 
Rainbow Jeremy says, what up, puppy? Shout out to Rainbow Jeremy. What up, what up, Rainbow Man? Max Nugaber, what up, Max? Chris Taylor, Blake Shaw, Michaela HV, 11D, Josh Valdez. What up, Josh? What's going on, brother? Max, nah, I'm not even going to try that one. And team Dimitrov, 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 what up, man? Yaladon, keep up the content. Much love, Yaladon. Let to, there's a lot of people out here, man. I'm trying to go through with these. Uh, Sam said, let's play some Flamingo 1-2 next month, Poppy. I'll be doing a bunch of uh, live meetup games out here in Vegas, guys, for World Series Poker uh, for Poplin Omaha. I will definitely be posting them on Twitter. And Sam, 100% down for a nice game with the Flam Flamingo, man. That's going to be a good time there. Uh, Rex Mendoza, what up, Rex? What up, Poppy? Says, loving the stream. Can we get some Viffer stories or Helmut stories? I will ask Jason when he comes back from his uh, resetting the internet connection for some Vegas. Let me put this down on my notepad right here. And um, and yeah, good idea. We always need some more Viffer stories. I agree. Who else we got out there, man? My God, I feel like I'm I feel like I'm running out of shots. Sasha, you got a question? I don't even know if Sasha's still here. Actually, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. Uh, she might not be. Hello, Makomski. What up, Bobby? What's going on, brother? Mnix five. You have the best poker vid ever. That night after got crushed. Mad funny. Thank you, Mnix, for enjoying my sadness as I lost a huge pocket back or quadra. I appreciate that you're happy about that. <laughs> David Plor Pl Plorda Plorty. David Plorty, what up, Poppy? What's going on, brother? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening, man? What's going on, man? I think I had everyone. Someone said, Am I gonna play cash games or tournaments for in the World Series of Poker? I am gonna play the Pop Minimum Hunt tournaments and I will play cash games, and I think that will be it. Uh Zachary Weatherford, what's your favorite board game to bet? My favorite board game to bet is Connect Four, and I will crush any of you guys in the chat in Connect Four. Lauren Malvoy, can we bring hookers? <laughs> Uh, sure. You can bring hookers to the game with the flingo. Why not? Nick Papa Giorgio, zero shout out needed. Okay. Logan Shoop, shout out to my mom. Enza Danino, it is her birthday, Joey. Lo Logan, shout out to your mother. Enza Dan Danino, happy birthday. Happy 21st birthday, mom. I hope that you're enjoying. I, I hope that you're having a good time. I hope that you're not watching this podcast on your birthday because that'd be strange. Uh, Dustin Wessel, good luck in the World Series of Poker this summer. Ready to get my GTO tanks out for the summer. Dustin, I am ready to get my GTO as, as a way of life tank top out for the summer as well, too. Very excited about that. We're still waiting for Jason to come back now, guys. I know you guys are, are, are bearing with me out here as I give these shout outs and they never end. And I just repeat Poppy over and over again. But um, but yeah, it is what it is. I mean, you could be doing worse, right? Someone said, what are you going to be playing this summer, Poppy? I'm going to be playing the great game of seeing as many people in poker as I can, going out a lot, playing Pop in Omaha, and trying not to ruin my life again like I did last year because last year I set myself back for about eight months, and uh, it was not good. Estonian Jesus, where did you get the idea to start doing the podcast? I got the idea to start doing the podcast because I was bored of the poker content that was being put out at this time about four years ago, I believe it is now at this point in time. And I wanted to create something that's Potlum Omaha related. And it was originally a Potlum Omaha idea. And then that transitioned to me having guest johns. And, and then from having guest johns, it transitioned into me really enjoying talking to guests. And I, and I found out that I could talk to people and I could get people to open up. I could have good conversations. I, yeah, I don't know. It was something I, I knew I could do actually before the podcast, but I didn't know I'd be that good in, in like a conversation interview type of format. And uh, yeah, I just kind of went with it. So Kept doing it. I was consistent. I kept doing two a week for many, many years. I never took really a week off until, I mean, maybe a year or two into it before I decided if I'm going to finally take a break. And um, and yeah, I've always had fun doing it. It's always been enjoyable. It's never felt like work. This never feels like, fuck, I got to do a podcast. It's more like I get to do podcasts. It's, I don't know. I love talking poker. I love talking with the people I have on the podcast. There's some really great people, very smart people, very hardworking guys who provide a lot of knowledge and inspiration to just myself and wisdom to myself and things I take away. And, and I felt like people would, you know, I'm happy people enjoy that. And, um, and yeah, I guess the first, the first part I made the podcast though was for Potlum and Omaha to, to get the great game out there to more people, to show people what Potlum and Omaha is all about. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, kind of, uh, it's kind of it. So a very br brief version of that. Mike Brenner. What's up, Mike? What's happening? Mike, what's going on, man? What's going on? We're still waiting for uh, Jason to come back. Once again, guys, if you're watching this, just scoot ahead. Just scoot ahead. Uh, Louis V, great idea, dude. Always entertaining and informative. Great guest, too. I um, Thank you, Louis V. I would agree. I would agree. I feel the same way. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I watch back the podcast when I want to, you know, maybe release something or kind of take some more wisdom in or Bill Perkins. I mean, you watch those back a lot because those are amazing podcasts. And, and yeah. Uh, what else did someone say? 
What did else someone say? Poppy news just broke. Football legend Ronaldo is going to marry two women at the same time. Um, that sounds great. I don't know much about that. That is awesome. Marcus says, how is your Mandarin going? My Mandarin is going awful, unfortunately. Uh, Aaron Unwin says, one versus one coon in basketball. Mm, I don't know. Jason. It's on mute right now. He's back, guys. Hold on. He's muted. Wait. Wait. He's muted. You guys can see him. Look, there he is. Is that a bird? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> he gave me a bird signal. Yeah, at the top of the page, Jason, settings panel. You can choose one of the audio microphones. Work, 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 work. Let's see if you can do it. Can you make it work? Look in Jason's eyes as he's in the lab right now trying to figure this out. <laughs> if you have uh, headphones, you can maybe try putting those on. And um, okay, back to the shout outs, guys. He's still getting it figured out. Where is our technical support? This is why Doug Polk has technical support, guys, because when times like this happen, they can uh, they can get helped out. And uh, and yeah, he said, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's all right. It happens. It happens, guys. This is this is uh, these live podcasts. You know, things happen sometimes. He can't afford Comcast Xfinity. Um, I'm sure he can. Jason has been hacked by Anonymous. He's maybe been hacked by Kane by uh, by somebody. I don't know who he'd be hacked by right now. Has Dan Coleman retired? I don't know. Dan Coleman's retired. I don't. I don't think so. But I think Dan still plays occasionally. I don't know if he's. Uh, I would doubt he's retired. Um, holy fuck, Joey asked Jay Kuhn about boxing in the yard experience. Okay, I will. Uh, Mark says, Joe, what do you think about short deck poker? I think short deck poker is very fun from the limited I've played it, and I am gonna play it more this summer. And hopefully we can get a game going at the win or get a game going at the aria. And uh, it will be the only time I play we play two card pop Manoha this summer. I think that will be it. Quite says two A plus guests two nights in a row. I would agree. We had Bryn Kenny on yesterday. It was very very good podcast. It was uh, he was highly entertaining. Fired a lot of shots. Just had a great mindset. I feel like. And uh, yeah, if you didn't see that one, I would definitely go back. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Perfect. Jason's back. All right. That was the that was the record length for time. I've I've uh, but I answered some questions too. It was good. Okay. It was good. Well, hopefully it holds up. I got a new computer, new internet. We'll see what happens. Cool. Well, let's uh what are you, you just having a spare computer sitting on the side or, or what's going on over there? Yeah, the uh the Mac wasn't cutting it. I had to bust out the, the big one. Oh, well, where were we at? Do we remember where we were where 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 we were at? It was about the family thing. legacy thing, and then you were asking me about what my summer plans were and i was going to say definitely play play intense but look after myself a little more than in, in times past it's easy to like not have discipline and just go jump in a tournament because you want to play but then you end up regretting it on the back end because you just wear yourself out yeah i mean that's um that, that's certainly something that can happen i think that's something people are discussing more about conserving their energy and kind of recharging and and not kind of going so hard, full hard tournament every day and that type of approach when i think a lot of people have gone that approach in summers past and maybe they've realized like that's not the only way to do it and also when you i guess when your bankroll improves you realize you don't necessarily have to grind some of these tournaments out that you maybe you felt like you needed to grind in the past or, or maybe you just did, you know, maybe you just did need to grind it out. Um, that's kind of the way that it works. It's like you, you sacrifice a bunch of time in the, in the beginning and, and then you just kind of, whatever that point is that you're trying to get to once, you know, you have a little more cushion, then maybe other things start taking priority. Poker is still very much top priority in my life. Like whenever it comes to, you know, earning, but, um, yeah, I've, I've put in so much work that sometimes I get to breathe now. Yeah, people were asking about Pio, I think it was. Yeah, they were saying, do you only study with Pio? Yeah, I, re I really like it. But, it, you know, the node locking and learning how to exploit people is like those. I think people are like quick to generalize and be like, oh, these guys that use solvers, they don't like think enough about other elements of the game, like how to exploit people the most. And if you're just trying to play like this equilibrium strat, you're you're torching it. It's like, no, if you just learn a baseline and then learn what's right from a theory standpoint, and then you see somebody doing something on the opposite end of that, you know perfectly how to exploit them. And and there's so much value in that. Yesterday on the podcast, Bryn Kenny, I just remembered this. He, he said that he's been trying to, I think he said he offered a challenge to Dominic and the team Germany 
I think it was like you, J you, Bryn and Jake Schindler, something like that. He's trying to get some sort of three on three bet with, with you versus uh, America versus Germany. And, and what's kind of your take on the current state of the, uh, of the high roller scene and kind of the, uh, the current people playing in those. Um, my one stance is I feel bad because nobody's really like team America, you know, nobody's like you, have you guys heard about team America lately? Because there's just so many Americans, right? Like Germans are their own unique people and some of them play differently and some of them are better and some of them are worse. And some of them just like Americans, some of them are awesome people and some of them not so much. Um, and I, I feel bad for those guys because they all get grouped into this, this category just because they're from Germany. Um, those are cool dudes. A lot of them are really, really cool and great at poker. And they have, uh, you take the Stefan Schlabel, for example, um, the dude plays fast. He's respectful. He's really nice. He's fierce. He plays good. Um, He's not one of these guys that deserves to be getting a bunch of shit for being slow or being a bum hunter. He's not. He shows up. He plays whatever. He plays fast. He's he's cool. Um, so, so a lot of them. But it, it's like anywhere in the world, there's assholes and there's great people. And a lot. Most of those dudes are really cool. And they're also very very good at poker. Um, the Americans. Everybody right now is kind of working hard. You know, tournaments are high stakes. Tournaments aren't necessarily the softest area to make a living anymore. You know, like those guys are all very, very, very good. It's not like any of those dudes that are grinding the high stakes um, tournaments all around the world, like they're not earning that much money in EV anymore. Like people are just too good. You know, it's not like there's this massive influx of, of American money flying into hundred Ks at the Bellagio or whatever. They're fun and you're making some money for sure if you're really good but you're not making some crazy living. I mean, some years you are, if you run out of this world, good. But um, my take is anybody that's a staple in high rollers and they're trying to win, they're probably one of the very best players in the world. And if you make some team bet over a sample of 30 tournaments, you're, you're effectively just leaving it all up to variance. It, it could be a fun competition, but it doesn't mean anything. Hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard this about the German. I mean, I, I guess I heard some of the German guys. I don't really hear about they play slow. I know Vogel saying play slow, but I haven't heard that about like Stefan or or, or the other Stefan or Fedor or any of those guys. You share no. pretty good things about most of those guys. Yeah, for sure. They're cool, man. They're they're good dudes. I, I like the Germans a lot. Uh, people said about uh, they wanted me to bring Stefan Sondheimer back on the podcast. Me and Stefan will definitely do a podcast when I see him again here in Vegas. We will... We will definitely have to do another podcast. So they kind of big timed him. They left him out of the 300K Super High Roller Bowl. So I'm. Uh, oh, he's in there now, though. He's in there now. Uh, Andrew Robel decided to stay uh, to not show up and play. So uh, Stefan gets a seat. Oh, okay. Interesting. So he was like the first alternate on the. I was surprised he was left out of that whole process to begin with. But I mean, I yeah, think that's it's pretty. Sure. Yeah, I think it's pretty. What do you think about that process of, of the, the people, way they choose and how they pick and, and the lottery system and, and that sort of whole thing? My first thought is the guys that are doing this Poker Go, Poker Central, Aria stuff are, I mean, it's like amazing what they've done for poker lately. Like half of the stuff we all talk about and compete at, it's all down there. You know, those dudes are killing it. Who in the world would put in like a state-of-the-art like, like they've done down there? You know, there's so much money those guys are throwing at poker in hopes that it's a mainstream thing. And you're talking trying to make it mainstream without the online poker money. You don't have full tilt throwing you 60 million a year to put it on mainstream CBS. You know, it's like all these guys are like, oh, you'll never be like this so and so person that was famous uh, in 2003. And it's like, yeah, no shit. We don't have $60 million. Like, we're not on mainstream advertisements during the suits around or whatever, you know? Um, so props to those dudes for trying to make something out of, there isn't that much money floating around America in advertising dollars. There's none for, for poker, you know? Um, and there's elections of the right to, there's a lot of guys that have been supporting their cause before it was big. And, you know, I, they get, they, they do get priority now overall, 
it doesn't necessarily seem like the most fair way to do it to some extent. I think like, I don't know. I, I'm totally cool with putting a guy in your tournaments if he showed up and paid rake in the last 80 that you've ran. You know what I mean? It's like he probably deserves to play your 300K even if he's not a, a mainstream figure because he's supported that entire system even whenever it wasn't on the air. Now, if the guy's showing up, hammering out all the tournaments, playing, and still isn't given the same, I think uh, that's, that could be questionable. Like maybe a more fair way to do it would just be purely based on volume. You look at the books, who's played the most tournaments there, and then they get to be in the automatic selection lottery or whatever. Yeah, it's definitely a, a uh, I don't know. I don't fault them for kind of the way they do it. It could it be more, could it be better, I'm sure. You know, do they want to have this perfect mix of a businessman in there as well? And they want to leave spots open for people in case they last minute decide to play. I, I mean, I, I think yeah. it's fine. I like the exclusivity of it. It it's kind of makes it a little bit more prestigious when you do get in. It kind of leaves something to talk about as well, too. It, it separates it from other poker tournaments out there. And yeah, I mean, and yeah, it's, like, it's a, it's it's a big like thing. If you want to put millions of dollars into running poker tournaments and making a TV production, be my guest if you want to select me or not. You know what I mean? They're doing that. That's their business. It's They're the ones putting all the money, all the effort, all the time into it. And if you want to criticize what they're doing, well, then go watch the other 24-hour poker streamed uh, network that's out there because it doesn't exist. Yeah, I agree. I kind of see it that way too. And, um, you know, we might not be people might not always be happy with certain people that did or didn't get in. But at the end of the day, I think the product is extremely well. It's very high quality. It's something, it's appointment viewing that we all look forward to watching. So for sure. you can't really yeah. ask for more than that. They created something out of thin air and made it into something really special. Yeah. And, and we're lucky to have it. We're lucky to get yeah. down there to get to go down there and play and we're lucky to get to watch it. Yeah, I agree with that, man. Let me, uh, let me find a couple more questions here in, in the chat. What are, where was that one trust? I just saw something. Does Kuhn, does Kuhn believe in running bad and down swings? Babyface ATL asks. I certainly, it's it's certainly a thing. Yeah, um, they're very real, and the more you're it is, but yeah, they they happen for sure. And it's just about keeping your head on and and coming back for more. That's what it's about. They they definitely happen. They happen to us all. Yes, Jason experiences down things and run bad. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, Harp says, "Who does Jason think is most similar to him in poker and the most different?" Wow, that's some serious questions. Uh, most different that Martin Cabral dude that's like sitting around like, like it's leaning over your shoulders with gloves on and shit. That dude is pick enemies, but that guy is a creep. Um, and then. Uh, most similar, I don't know. I think Ben Tolerine tries really hard to live a balanced life and listen to himself, but I think it would be arrogant for me to say that I'm anywhere near the level he is as a poker thinker. I think that um, he's far superior to me in um, execution and uh, the way that he, that he plays the game, but definitely in trying to do the balance and live his life for his own means and take care of himself physically, mentally, emotionally. I, th I think that him and I share that in common. Hmm. Is Ben playing? Ben's playing the 300 case for Hollow Bowl, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's just been chilling, man. Ben, ben Dunn went and made it. He made it a long time ago. We're all, we're all peasants. And he, he's just. Yeah, man. Ben's, uh, Ben's obviously been a beast for a very long time. So that's yeah. a good question, though. Who, who do people, I got to start working that in, Harps. That's a really good, that's a kind of a good question. Who is, yeah, that was, that was a good question for sure. That's a very good question. Yeah, who is most, I mean, who do I think is most similar to Jake? Well, I think about, I mean, to me, it's maybe like maybe like Lafort, Lafort, you, Lafort, and you kind of similar to me. I mean, obviously, the whole workout thing involved, and you guys take a lot of great pride in being in shape and, and just being committed on that end. And also, kind of the way you think about things. And I feel you two, you two, kind of sound similar to each other to me. Yeah, he's really, he's really legit, dude. Yeah, I like Lafort a lot. I um miss him a little bit. You know, he's kind of he's been a little bit out of the poker. Still playing poker, but he's been a little bit out of the, you know, kind of the, the, the conversating and making videos or even on social media kind of thing like that. So he's been enjoying his life up in Toronto and kind of comes down here to Vegas once in a while. So he's uh, he's certainly somebody I, I miss in the poker world out, out here. Let me, uh, uh, David Hodge, Jay Kuhn, how do you balance your caffeine intake? Can you play long sessions without any at all? I, um, that's a good question as well. I, on most days, days that are average days for me, I, I will have two 
two cups of coffee. I have one in the morning and then I have one about 3 p.m. and then I'm done. If, like, take for instance me being heads up in that uh, short deck tournament, I was like on eight days of sleep dash games, had no energy left, and I said, all right, I'm playing for $3.66 million here. And it was like a $1.3 million heads up sit and go or something. So I was like, I'm cranking the caffeine and I'm going to be punished for the next couple of days for this. But it's worth it because the stakes are so big. So if it's the end game of something and I know I get to feel like shit for the next few days, if I close it out, um, I'll crank it super hard. But generally, if you rely on caffeine over and over and over again, the wheels will come off for sure. Hmm. What, what are your kind of your go-to snacks right now for just poker or throughout the day if you want to? If you want to fill in some calories, um, man, I, the diet's just like, I'm so obsessed with the food. The food is like one, it brings me so much happy eating and two, just figuring out what's right for my body. Um, if I'm stuck at a poker table and I don't get to eat the meals I want, I carry as really good. Um, I think overall that guy's kind of sell it, but I'll show you, I'll show you a couple bars. Uh, so these are really good. They're just like they're just like collagen protein, cashew butter. The vanilla shortbread's really good. Highly recommended. Um, what, what brand is this one, Jason? Uh, Bulletproof. Bulletproof. So, okay. Yeah. So they're MCT oil. So you get those medium chain triglycerides that you need for the fat, and you get the cashews, which are just like loads and loads of fat, no sugar. Um, so highly recommend that. Also, um, I dig like some of the grass fed jerkies. Like the Epic bars are good. The bison, with which is habanero cranberry, I really like a lot. Um, stay away from the salmon. The salmon uh, Epic bars, they taste like dog food. Um, but for meals, I'm all for anything avocado, throwing uh, olive oil, coconut oil, fatty fish, and just loads and loads of steamed greens. Make sure uh, you're not doing too many raw Raw greens really crush you because there's a zelic acid in them and can make you quite sick if you're just eating like tons and tons of raw kale salads. You should be blanching uh, most of your greens before you eat them. So just drop them in boiling water for 20 seconds or something and then eat them. It gets rid of that acid. How has your, uh, your professional chef ability been, been, uh, been working lately? Professional chef what? How is your professional chef ability, aka your ability to cook damn well, oh, I, been working? I, I'm yeah, I'm pretty solid. I'm definitely pretty solid. Uh, I've been playing so much the last two years that Bianca has been carrying the the weight, but she kills the game too. But yeah, I can I can definitely cook. We'll have to uh, this summer have have some powwows and do some. I'll cook you up some some fun meals for sure. I'll uh, I'll bring I'll bring Sasha over there too, and uh, she can uh, absolutely. That way I get to meet. So you, you and Bianca, you guys have been together for a very long time. Is this, is this something that, uh, are we seeing? We're getting old, kid. <laughs> what are we, what are Joey we, are pod, we... bro. Since the first time we did the Joey pod, we got together like two days after that. That's crazy. Um, that is really yeah, crazy. it's wild, man. Um, yeah, it's going great. She is an absolute monster. It's like, uh, she's just a dream for me. She's, she's, uh, so consistent and helps me with all this stuff. She's made massive sacrifices. She was grinding a finance gig in Manhattan gave it all up to travel with me. And, uh, you know, we, we train to get, we do absolutely everything together. We train together, cook together, um, just roll around and really our best pals. And, um, it gets, it's something that, you know, with work, it's, it's truly nice to see somebody that wants to grow with you. And we've been doing a really good job of that. And there's no, there's no secret why I've, I've been thriving in poker since we've been together. It's, she helps me recover, helps me stay focused doesn't let me feel sorry for myself which is really easy to do as a gambler mm -hmm. for sure i mean i feel like having that supportive person around who can uplift you when you're when you're feeling down and kind of reinvigorate you when when you're when you're not energetic or even keep kind of maintaining that balance outside with diet with your workout with things that you're passionate about and, and things sure. that you want to succeed at i mean those are yeah. and just keep you in check man just be like yo that's out of line you shouldn't do that or like you know it's really easy to your brain just justifies things and it's really awesome to have somebody who like, you know, isn't maliciously trying to mess with you, tell you like you're doing this wrong because then you can take that, those words to heart and actually add them into your life equation. And, and it helps you, uh, helps you get through the day for sure. Did you mention, it was a story you said that was she watching the first podcast and then she sent you That's a right. message? Wait, what was, what was that story again? She, you sent her, like, how did that work again? What was that? 
And we were doing the pod and like, uh, you know, I've been chasing her around for like five or six years on and off. And she was always big time in me because she was too hot for me. Um, and uh, she was watching the pod and we finally got her. Like she, she was like, Hey, I'm working in Florida right now, but how about I fly out to San Fran and we'll, we can hang out for a few days out there. And I was just like, I'll see you there. And, and the rest was history, man. That's actually insane. I mean, yeah. I forgot about that, but that's crazy. That's crazy that you were a chaser and then she watched you on the pod and she's like, wait a sec, this guy's not so dad damn bad. Let me go, let me go hang yeah. out with this guy. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, like, like her parents are the greatest people ever and they're so sweet and you ever hardly ever hear them cuss. And then I didn't realize how often I was dropping the F-bomb on that podcast. And then dad watched it and I was going, oh my God, no way. Because I just sounded like a, like a hoodlum. So her dad watched the podcast. At, was this after? Or when was this? Yeah, he was cool. I mean, before we were together, he watched it. He was like, he checked it out. He liked it. No judgment. I was f this, f that, and he still didn't give me any heat about it. Damn. Yeah. I mean, you don't. You don't. I don't think you've sweared much at all this podcast. Yeah. You don't. You don't really. She cleaned me up, man. She cleaned me up. I still drop it here and there, but definitely cleaned me up a little bit. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I'm glad. Uh, I mean, it's kind of crazy that the podcast. Brought the, I, mean, I don't even know. Yeah, That's it kept me out of street fights. I haven't, I haven't been in a street fight since we've been together. I'm retired, man. Completely retired. For like four or five years since I've been in a fight. Well, we all remember. We all remember your very vivid storytelling of the street fight of in the hotel and when the guy was up in the hotel room and you know the boom. <laughs> I mean, I listen, I remember that. The time I met the Lego guys, I I, I told that one right. That was like my favorite. Cause I like met Seaver and Dan Smith and those guys, like some dude was at O'Shea's picking on him and I like headbutted him out cold. And that was how I met the Lego guys. They didn't even know who I was. It was like 2009 or something. <laughs> uh, someone said to Jake who knew a lot of street fighting. Um, he, he, I, he engaged in, he engaged in physical activity, I believe. Allegedly. I don't really, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I asked Jake Kuhn about that question. I'm not sure. But he's retired now and now he's frozen. Is he really You're frozen? Back. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's get one more question here, Jason, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. We'll let you get going. Let you get, um, get out you know, with your day guys. I'll, I'm going to find the best question in the chat. And that's the one I'm asking guys. I'll get, I'll let For you guys sure. hit me with it. If you guys want one more, more street fight stories. Than one of them. <laughs> nah, I'm done, man. Retired old man. Stay out of street fights. That's how you get sued. How, how old are you now, Jason? 32. Fuck man. We're old. It's crazy. It's, 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 gonna it's be absolutely crazy. It's gonna be fuss forty two one day and being like, man, remember back ten years ago I did that podcast? Yeah, but and that's cool, man. I, I it's cool. I like getting older. I get like calmer and and things like everything doesn't have to be so high stakes. You know, in your twenties, everything's so high stakes. It's like you have an argument, and it's just like, oh like you know, it's just not like that anymore. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Nick, Nick Katie says, what does Jay Kuhn think about the future of online poker? I mean, that's actually a uh, kind of a good thing to, to last talk about. So obviously you're with party poker right now. You're a uh, party poker. I think you're on like the panel, but you're, you've been yeah. pretty involved with them. I feel like you've been talking yeah. about them. They've been talking about you and, sure. and of course, run at once poker's in the works with Phil Galfon sites. You're a member of run at once poker. You're, you put out a lot of great videos and great content that you guys yeah. can watch on run at once.com. If you'd like to check those out. And, and yeah, what's kind of your future of online poker? What, what do you where do you see things happening? I mean, man, party poker. I, if I was a part of it, or if I wasn't a part of it, I'd be like, those guys are making waves. They really are. They are killing the game. Um, super happy to be a part of that. I'm such a, a massive John Duthie fan, and and Rob Young, the guy that is running the show, is he's a really cool dude. He's excited about poker. Um, they're making moves with the Triton guys. So now you got the Triton guys working with the party guys. This is some serious business, man. Uh, they're really making waves. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about that. And I think that the future of poker is it's definitely going to be different. You know, there's the ways to learn are different and people are good. But you've got a lot of people that are excited with Phil and with Party that are excited about looking after the pros and trying to help the amateurs stick around. So um, there's there are better days ahead. You know, there are better days ahead than this spin and go bullshit, than these guys running these just – Break them. Um, there's a there are ways to make a lot of money in poker without just completely ending it for everyone. It doesn't have to be gambling, um, and and that's on the way. And the live stops are going to be better and better. I highly recommend coming to parties live stops. They're just torching money, taking care of people right now. Like like I keep telling them, 
And guys, I don't parties and upgrades for everybody and this and that. Highly recommend coming right now. I don't know how much longer that's sustainable. So I'd say show up and have some fun. Um, but yeah, the, 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 you know, I don't think it's, I don't think they're going to be turning percent ROIs anymore like there were whenever we first started. I just think that that's impossible. But you're definitely going to be able to make a good living playing a game that you love to play and be able to do it from your home. Hopefully the American government cools their jets and lets us start to play a little bit from places that aren't just interest state poker poker sites and we can actually play internationally again. Well, I, we'll see about that. I mean, maybe that's years away. And by then the bots and the technology and the software, I don't even know where yeah, the fucking, that, that stuff's going to be at by then. So that's a whole nother yeah, but you story. Got, you, got guys, you got guys like Phil and John and Rob and those dudes are, they're, they're smart. if there's ever a pro who stood a chance to make a site that could thrive, it's Phil. And on top of that, the guy's integrity is the highest of anyone I've ever met. Um, he's, he's seriously poker's Robin Hood. I think that if there's ever going to be one role model in poker, it will always be Phil Galfon. He's the voice of reason. Somehow has been logical and reasonable since he was 20 years old. I don't know how that's possible. He's always been the same guy. And I can tell you as a close personal friend, um, I would, I would trust him with everything that I've ever won and, and he will always give you the truth. So I, I, I think that that's a bright future. Uh, for what he's going to do, and he's smart and adaptive. So sure, it might get tougher, um, and, and the poker. But these guys, are, the smart people, care about poker. They're in power positions right now, and they're going to be running sites like Party, and they're going to be running sites like Run at Once, and they're going to be good spots for us. I guarantee that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that everything we've seen so far from Party Poker is uh, on the up and up. As you mentioned, they are spending a lot of money. I do not know how long that will, how long that will keep happening. We shall see. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I like what I'm seeing so far from them. I'm like what I'm seeing some from Phil so far. He said that the site should be live in the summertime, so we will see if that stands on schedule. And uh, I don't know. I'm going to be supporting that. I'm supporting anything that is pro poker that's good for poker players recreational and professional and not just a complete money grab like poker stars is now and um and i guess one last thing i want to ask you about what do you how do you think about the people that are still sponsored by poker stars and the people that are still that are maybe streaming or like daniel who, who are the voice of poker stars you know does your opinion on these guys change because they're still taking money from stars and they're still sending people to play on poker stars at all Man, it, it's real. Okay, so it's it's real easy to sit here in my chair and and say what they're doing is, isn't right. Um, but everybody's got to make a living in this world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of gray areas in what's right and wrong. And I can tell you from personal experience, um, somebody like Liv Burry, I think she's... Uh, such an admirable person. I think she's high integrity. I think she's really good for the poker world. Uh, Igor, the same. Daniel, you know, I know people got their beefs with Daniel, but he's always been good to me. And I think like he's got a pure heart. I think that he, he wants to do what's right. Um, and you know, I, I don't know, man. It's like somebody's putting like $4 million a year in your account. You know, it's like, can you really judge the guy? Like, like, at the end of the day, you got to get yours to some degree. I don't know. Like, like, you know, infinite amounts of money by, by poker stars. He was getting paid so much money and he showered them. I mean, he was just like, I'm out. I just straight up left them. You want to talk about a boss? That was big money he was making. Um, and I do think that like to a certain point, like there are a lot of people that would bounce, but like, yo, if you're only making X amount a year and then like, Somebody's like kind of paying for your family, paying for this or that. And they're not like, they're, they're telling you straight up, like, Hey, we're robbing you for the most part, you know, like, like I think what they're doing is really fucked up. And I think that it's, uh, unsustainable and bad for poker. And I do like frown upon it that they're supporting it. I totally do. I think like, you know, if Daniel was sitting here right now, I'd give him some shit about it. I'd be like, dude, you know, you're super paid. You're the man. You, you will leave a legacy in poker. You're probably the most famous poker player of all time. I think it would be the bo most boss move ever for him to just be like, yo, I'm out. I don't support this anymore. But like we're all our own people, and I think it's a lot easier to judge from the outside and not be standing there in their shoes. I, for the most part, those guys and gals, they, they seem like 
good people. And I think that the system in Amaya is super screwed. And I think that those guys are making awful decisions and the board are scumbags. But I don't think I don't think that they're pros that I mentioned. I, th I think they're good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think the uh, I think a lot of the guys that are sponsored by Poker Stars right now, whether streamers or people that have been around the site for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I get I get it. Like I, I can't I'm not going to get angry at these people or kind of you know get upset at them for for taking money from stars or supporting their family or I mean some of these guys I don't know if they're making much money at poker this might be how they're making money so I can't really exactly. be upset at that no and yeah. that's something that's something especially for these streamers and I'm not saying who I'm sure some of them are winners and some of them aren't but it's like yo if you're if you're breaking even at poker and somebody comes along and offers you 100k a year or something it's like that's an excuse <laughs> yeah. to not go get a day job you know like for sure yeah it's like it's it's different for everybody and stars is like hey rake increases hey you want to come gamble and play this it's like pretty easy to watch one of your podcasts and realize really quickly that stars is just a complete racket it's a complete you're basically getting on there and scratching off lottery tickets you know so it's like if you're the dumbass that gets on there to play hypers and and uh spinning goes all day it's kind of on you man you know mm -hmm. yeah that's how i look at you know the, the acr stuff with the cheating stuff happening on america's card and winning poker network and and people kind of, they, they always leave me messages now like, oh, you got to talk about this or you got to keep talking about this. I'm like, listen, I kind of put a lot of stuff out there about this site. If you want to keep playing on the site, like, you know what they're about. You know, they're trying, they're, they're going to, they're going to do something. They're not, they don't have security. Yeah. Like there might be a bunch of cheating happening on the site. You know, this going into the site. So it, when things happen on the site, I mean, yeah. if you come to me about it, you know, sure. I've told you about it. I've warned you about sure. it. If you keep playing on there, it's at your own risk. And, and you know, you're kind of saying, Hey, take my money. Exactly you're right. It. If you if you log into stars and you play for six months and you get your eyes raked out and, and you were a good player and you still lost thirty thousand dollars or whatever, eh, you know, we told you. You know, we, yeah. we told you that was gonna happen. And yeah, that's just the way it works. Now, if one of these pros is like on YouTube being like, No, stars is really good for the poker economy, and what we're doing is good for poker. Now, if they're doing that all the time, then they gotta get called out for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and on some degree, I do think that stars is good for the poker community in a, in a weird way, because I think they are bringing in a lot of new players to the game. Now they're bringing in new players to the game to a place where they can't win, but they are bringing new players in. So my kind of hope is maybe they find other sites, or they find other content or, or these sorts of things like that. And you know, I'm trying to find a positive from it, but yeah, at the same time, if they these are people they're bringing in the people they're bringing in obviously aren't winners of poker. Um, so that's kind of a net positive to the poker world, but um stars is also kind of starting to be the good at making these changes and it's like yeah no shit because they're feeling the heat you know we're coming for them, man 100 percent party's coming for you we're going to take your market share like we're going to treat people better than you and we're going to smash your site that everybody thinks is unbeatable and we're going to that site will be number two i promise you we're going to crush them 100 percent because the good guys are going to win in this guaranteed and then once phil comes out there's another piece of their market share that's gone and people mm -hmm. aren't stupid. Gamblers aren't stupid. They're not. Like, you know, these, especially at this, this is a really, really hard way to make a living. Even if the, even if the market's good, even if the ecosystem's good, it's a hard way to make a living. So people aren't idiots and you can already see it. Go on Reddit and look at a forum. Everybody's like, yo, cashed out my money on stars, moved it over to the micro stakes on party. It's happening. Uh, and just keep happening. And another year or two, we'll be like, oh yeah, do you remember when stars was, robbing everyone and now look what happened to them that's just what's going to happen yeah i agree i think it's only a matter of time before something like that happens i mean maybe they might make changes that are more player friendly like we've seen with this 25k tournament where they're giving out platinum passes and they're sort of riding yeah. this wave of promotion and, and this sort of thing for the entire year i mean it's kind yeah. of genius in a way that they've formed a system where they can just promote this every stop. They can buy the goodwill with this. They get the player. I mean, it's it's a cool experience for people who get a who are going to get an opportunity to play this event next year. It's cool for the pros as well because you're going to have a lot of pretty bad players in this tournament. I'm sure you're going to be playing this as well because it's you know yeah, it's, it's for sure the biggest value 25 Ks of all time. So I mean, it's yeah, they are. It's obviously great, and they have genius business people working for their company. I mean, they're a multi-billion-dollar corporation. This is—they're not idiots, you know. Like, like they have smart people making decisions up there. They just don't know shit about poker, and they don't care about poker. That's really right. What exactly. Talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when it comes to these guys, are bad businessmen. They're fucking geniuses. They're obviously really smart. They—they they just acquire a company for what five billion dollars or something yeah. like that. 
they know what they're doing and they're good at making money. They're good at those things, but right. They don't care about poker. They don't know poker. They don't like, I don't think they give a fuck if anyone makes money at poker. So they care about poker stars making billions of dollars. Yeah. They want that stock price to go up. That's that's what it's about. Period. Yeah. I mean, that's their game. Their game's business. Our game's poker. We fight for our game. They fight for their game. That's, yeah. that's how things work. Yeah. Let them run their like little magic deck kind of poker games and their spin and goes and all that. That's cool. Let them have that and let people walk the streets playing them on their mobile phones or whatever. But if you want to play some real poker, come over to a site that gives a shit about players. Like that's, it's that simple. Yeah, I agree, man. I agree completely with that. Uh, last question from Harbs. Harb says, what is the number one thing he hopes we take away from what he said in this podcast? That I hope you take away. Mm -hmm. Um, We should all, one, start, like we said in the beginning, I think there needs to be more admiration for what we're all trying to do. I think it's really easy to torch each other, and I don't think that it's good for anyone. I also think it makes us look like shit publicly. I think that if we're all like in a hope to prove that this is a skill game and this is a game that, that hard work will produce winners and our government should support the fact that we should be able to play uh, play poker from within this country against everyone else in the world, well, then they don't need to think we're a bunch of damn hooligans or a bunch of 16-year-olds. It's like, let's get with it. We're 30 years old or 40 or 25 each other better. Let's start acting more professional. Um, on top of that, let's, uh, let's, let's think as a community on the changes that need to be made in the poker world. Like party, for instance, like we're we're screwing things up every day, you know? Like we we decided that the 10K in Barcelona was too big for the average player, so that won't happen again. Or we dropped the entry fees in the high rollers, so there's 3% less rake in the high rollers now. Um, you need to communicate with people and, and do it in a constructive way. Don't just come with the torches and, and expect to burn things down. We are working together to make changes. So that that's really the biggest thing is like, let's just chill with the hate. It's fun wants to call people out. It's fun to do this and that, but like we're all in our own situation. And unless somebody's robbing or, or doing something scummy like full tilt did, or like you said, super using or, or not being responsible with technology or whatever. Yeah. Come after people real hard for that. But I think a little less, a little less beaking at each other, a little less war and a little more constructive thought on how we can all grow together as a poker community. I like that a lot. Definitely like that a lot. Guys out there, if you want to follow Jason's adventure in the world, follow him on Twitter or Instagram, even though he doesn't post on either very often at Jason Coon. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, we will we will be watching the Super High Roller Bowl. We'll be cheering you on, Jason, as well. And uh, and yeah, man, as always, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'll be I'll be putting a couple of these clips on YouTube out there, guys, because or, I'm sorry, out on Twitter and social media because I um that's one of my New Year's resolutions as of uh, as of two days ago. So, uh, so yeah, there's been a lot of good stuff in here, Jason, as always appreciate you coming on, appreciate the insight into those massive hands you played over at the Triton Poker series. I'm sure people in the chat sure. are, uh, yeah. people in chat, very happy and, and very, uh, they enjoy the podcast very much. So yeah, we will, right. uh, we'll talk with you soon. We'll get an update. Much love guys. I'll, I'll be back soon. All right. Peace out everybody. I'll be back tomorrow with the video about the Chris Ferguson, uh, video he released as well. And then next week I got those videos with Phil Gafond. I think one or two will put those out. I'll also be doing the super high rollable recaps after uh, after the show is over the next morning. So uh, Sunday I'll be doing Monday, et cetera, Monday, Tuesday. You know, you guys, you guys understand. And uh, that's it. Much love, everybody. Give us a thumbs up if you like the podcast. Give us a thumbs down if you hate me and Jason. And um, and that's it. Much love. Peace out. Adios. Later. Take care.